Okay, well, it's gone two o'clock. Uh, I appreciate there's probably a few stragglers uh, on their way back, but uh, I think uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's let's get going. Um, I did say as, as we broke that we'd just pick up this um, uh, affordable housing uh, discussion uh, a little further. Um, could, could I just um, get to Miss Dane? Just just check uh, a few. Well one request and check a, a few facts and figures. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, uh, you referred to uh, a government decision, I, f I forget where and, and the precise date, which effectively uh, signed off that this scheme would uh, effectively be H, policy H6 compliant rather than H5. Could you send the paperwork or the link to the paperwork to the programme officer or could you just put, if, if it's somewhere in my massive bundle of documents you can point me to it yeah so I, I, I can point you to the historic position plus the formal position that's the, the uh, island plan requirement uh, just to point out um, a, a nuance in the policy there that um, by virtue of it being approved in the government plan it does make it compliant with h5 um, it doesn't defer it to H6. It makes it both compliant with H5 and H6 because there is the exception built into policy H5 um, that allows an alternative uh, tenure split, so open market homes. To well, they're, they're linked, aren't they? They are. They are linked. But just to, just to clarify, by virtue of the approval of the government plan, which is the budget, which I can send to you, um, that brings it uh, in line with the requirement of policy H5. Okay. And what are you going to send me? Am I going to see a lot of detail there, or is it just going to be a line in a budget? So I can send you um, uh, the government plan pages. There will be two pages in the uh, approved government plan for 2023. Um, and if you would like it, I can also um, forward you the uh, state's report that, that uh, precedes the approval of the island plan, which talks to the same uh, principles. That would be useful. If you could send those to Helen, and we'll add them to the inquiry documents list. That's great. Um, I also just um, wanted to check what you were saying about support for purchasers. And you were talking about um, that support was, was creeping up in terms of the... Uh, I think you talked about income quintiles. Um, could you just run that past me again? Because I, I must have got confused. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Statistics Jersey uh, uh, published a report about the island's uh, income distribution. Um, it is, uh, I think, quite widely accepted that the, there uh, is income inequality in Jersey, i.e. The, the haves and the have-nots, where you have people who are on very low incomes and you have people who are on very high incomes. So the income distribution survey outputs that are published by Statistics Jersey are very helpful to understand the levels of affordability in the island and where um, on a line of, if, if, you, if you put everybody in a, a linear line of affordability, um, uh, where the, the sweet spot of home ownership um, actually exists. Um, uh, the statistics has published many, I, I mean, I can, I can send you some slide images that have some graphs that, that may be helpful to, to you. Um, you quite often talk about median incomes, or people quite often reference median incomes as being um, a point at which people should be able to reasonably afford a home, being the midpoint income of, of the island if you put everybody in a row. Um, the reality, however, in Jersey is that because of the, um, the escalating house prices um, and the constraints on affordability, is that that tipping point of when a home becomes affordable is much higher up the scale of income distribution. So, that, so where uh, an aspiration may be that people on median income should be able to afford to purchase a home, the reality is it's people in the upper quintiles that can afford to buy a home. So it's the relative to the island's income uh, distribution and the levels of income inequality, it is the higher income people who can afford to purchase a home. So what we've done or are doing and in the process of doing um, with our affordable housing policies is widening the eligibility of um, assisted purchase housing 
to um, basically close, help close that gap and, and uh, bring it more in line with uh, affordability at medium income levels. But that does mean setting the threshold particularly high. Um, so um, entirely off the record and without prejudice to the publication of the policy, um, we were previously at, you know, for say a three or four bedroom home, uh, household income of about £85,000. Uh, don't quote me on the exact figure, but, but, but ballpark figure. Um, we would be now talking about needing to extend that to about £130,000 as a household income um, to help people uh, afford a home um, uh, that, um, relative to the affordable housing policy. So what that means is if, if somebody was on that income, they would become eligible to receive the subsidy that is provided through a shared equity scheme. So in the case here of Jersey Development Company, um, if you were lo looking at their model um, of, of, say, 15% of the development offered a 25% shared equity arrangement, you would be providing that individual with a 25% subsidy on that home. So it doesn't reduce the value of the home. Um, it doesn't um, deal with the overall prevailing affordability issue in the island. It simply gives a, a individual or 15% of this development's worth of individuals a subsidy to help them purchase a home. Um, and I, I, if you don't mind for me to just carry on slightly, and, and that really gets to the heart of my point that I was making earlier um, about there being a risk here that if this, for argument's sake, this entire development was delivered at 100% affordable housing, which would be 100% subsidised homes, that would mean 1,000 households getting a direct subsidy of circa 25% um, to help them purchase, which would not solve the overall affordability issue on the island. It would simply artificially depress the values on that site. And so whilst it is quite a difficult concept, um, somewhat perverse in many respects, to say that in order to make homes more affordable, you need to provide less affordable homes, it is true because we're talking about a subsidy here. We're not talking about dealing with the housing market conditions. And what's very important with this development and the quantum of housing that it will provide is it will help us to correct the supply demand imbalance that is driving the affordability issue on the island. So the real benefit here is the delivery of the homes. It's not necessarily the delivery of the subsidy. Um, the other point to make on the subsidy um, is that the, the say for argument's sake, the model of 15% of the units at 25% shared equity level, um, benefiting circa 150 people, um, those, uh, those 150 people get the benefit to the detriment of the entire island that could realise the benefit from the community infrastructure investment that would be realised. So that's where my role in, in both housing and regeneration is quite important because it's not simply about the housing provision, it's about the conditions around the housing and the environments that we are making to make um, these urban environments livable. And that's where the consideration of both factors in this scheme is, is very, very important because the delivery of the scheme as a whole, um, its viability and the cross subsidisation from the development activity through to the community infrastructure enhancements uh, benefits the island as a whole, not just a limited number of people who will benefit from a, a direct subsidy that will, um, in the short term, depress the value of their property. So, as I say, it's complicated um, to, to, to discuss to the layperson, I, I appreciate, and that on face value it sounds somewhat perverse. Um, but, the, <coughs> but I trust in, in, in the theory um, that the, the, the issue here is, is the supply and demand imbalance, uh, provision of affordable subsidised homes is very important to help satisfy a part of the market, but providing homes for all of the market, people who are ineligible for affordable homes or do not wish to have an affordable subsidised home, is of equal import. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I, I think I follow what you're saying. Um... Mm. If, if, it, if it helps, um, well, it doesn't necessarily help for today, um, but this is a very the future of Jersey's housing market and whether or not... So, so if, if we, you know, I think there's, there's a widely accepted position that we are pursue, want, would like to pursue an island um, where home ownership is accessible to all. Um, we equally recognise the role of, and uh, the very significantly important role of the provision of social housing as, if you like to say, the extremes of the housing market, of the people who can afford to purchase and the people who can't even so much as afford to rent. The space that sits in between that, which is open market and subsidised purchase housing, um, cannot 
be neglected. Um, but what would be very helpful is to have a long-term housing strategy that could guide you as to the, the proportions of the housing market that we would actually like to see, which would, we would consider to be healthy for Jersey's economy and the overall housing market as a whole. The Minister for Housing and Communities is committed to developing that long-term housing strategy, but it does not yet exist. So all we can talk about is the aspirational principles that we believe to be right for Jersey and its economy and the well-being of its housing market. And that really is what, what I hope you, you can see is driving my comments, that it's very difficult to attach that to a strategy because that long-term strategy doesn't exist. But the underpinning principles of a housing market that serves all islanders um, and that is not artificially depressed through a, uh, a subsidy that is limited in its scope and reach to a, a very finite number of islanders, we don't let that compromise the deliverability of the entire South West St Helier scheme, which, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, the, the wider community benefits are as important as the housing delivery itself. Okay. Now, just for the break, I think, Mr Young, you wanted to say something about okay affordable housing. Yes. Thank you very much. I apologise for being late. I was getting my lunchtime sandwich, mm. but I got the gist of that last discussion. I think so. I find myself, I think, kind of perhaps for the first time this week in a situation where I feel the need to both challenge <coughs> the, um, the policy interpretation uh, as put forward by the government and indeed the situation uh, as regard this particular application, which is obviously your focus. Um, and I bet they are connected in terms of this policy H5. In that I was the member who I was the driving force behind um, this policy, including the two paragraphs that you concentrated on, which is about the, um, the use of um, states of Jersey or states' own companies' land, that they should be um, a starting point of all of them being affordable uh, unless there was a, um, a need, a development spe need specifically to provide open market homes where this was required to ensure, ensure the viability, and this key word viability is, is, is vital, of public realm and public realm and community infrastructure delivery. And then the words in line would have an improved government plan. And there is inherent a procedural requirement in that, is that the government plan is an annual process. The states of Jersey law, or the, sorry, the public finances law, requires the government produce an annual, an annual government plan, which is a, a fancy name for what used to be called the budget. Yeah. And um, basically, that's when the government sets out its financial plans um, for the next, I think it's, I can't recall if it's two years or three, but, in, but basically it's a short-term financial plan. Virtually all of the debate is concentrated on the next year's plan. So the reference was made to the plan being attached to the application, the um, plan approved in November 22. Um, what was being said is that, well, what I heard said was that doesn't include any allocation um, to the SOJDC uh, of capital spends because the budget is both revenue and capital and use of assets and others. It doesn't include any funding uh, to, to fund infrastructure. Therefore, I heard the argument from the applicant, that means that all of the infrastructure and every cost needs to be um, funded from the sale of our open market homes, but except in the 15% minimum. So that, that I see the applicant obviously relies upon that for that they've qualified with the policy as written. But I really believe, and it was certainly my intention in forcing the amendment, and it was quite difficult to get agreement, but I got it through in the end. It was reluctant agreement because my colleague ministers didn't want it, but the state's members as a whole went with it, is that the mechanism of uh, the states having the option to be able to vary the proportion of affordable homes on an annual basis through the government plan. That key thing was an annual basis through the government plan. Now, we've only had one government plan, and what we've got here is an application which we've heard is for a development framework, which if it's approved as it stands, 
will effectively set the basis for applications uh, for uh, over the next uh, 12 years. So there is, I think, I heard you say, sir, and you asked in your questioning, and I think you're bang on, where is the viability assessment that demonstrates definitively that there needs to be um, a, a requirement only for 15% and not a higher percentage for affordable? Where is that? And I know that in the UK, I might, I might, I'm not an expert in the UK, but my understanding is that you would expect to see a viability assessment. And my assumption was, and I think this was implicit, is that there would be a processes uh, um, adopted within the government plan because <coughs> the government plan is not prescriptive. The government can change it. And uh, my, my expectation was, and my colleagues were, is that there would be an annual uh, part of that government plan which would deal with the allocation of capital spend to states' own companies in some detail. We don't have that. As far as I know, I can't see we have that information. And I think it's an essential part in being asked to give consent for this on the basis that there is that information available as part of the application. And it is, I, you know, so I think that's a major, major issue in terms of the machinery of this uh, decision. And, and, of course, the extra point was made is, well, look, um, it stands in substitution for policy H6. Well, policy H6 was our first attempt ever that I managed to get through the states that every single private sector housing development in Jersey should have a requirement for 15% affordable homes. Every single one. Uh, I think it's subject to, uh, I think, or is accepted that there could be on small sites some um, commuted arrangement, I seem to remember. But nonetheless, that the principle is there. And in order to give developers time to come up with that, that was deferred to implementation from January 23. And I certainly agree with the planning, with the department's view that that policy is in force, irrespective of the fact that the minister has not yet been issued any detail about assisted purchase projects and so on, because the intention was is that developers would bring put forward their, their proposed schemes and they would get government approval. So I think it's not fair to say that, well, the 15%, you know, what we've got here is H, what, H5 and H6 work together. It is cumulative. And so, sir, I think that's really important in terms of determining the application, because this application, a consent, will be in place for a very long time. Uh, and so I think it's important that, um, yes, it is true that both of these elements that I've described are changes. They are very new and quite, I have to say, revolutionary for Jersey, the, because um, it, Jersey has always been reluctant to impose um, those, those requirements on developers, but the housing crisis is such that it justifies it. And that leads me to the policy position. I heard the argument, of course, is that if we have more affordable homes, this diminishes the open market situation. I'm not arguing for 100% affordable homes. I'm arguing for a viability assessment to show what it needs to be so that the government can make an informed decision through the process of what infrastructure and what community uh, public realm is being funded through this means. And I personally think it isn't just a question of market forces in terms of how that's applied. It's really, I think, a matter of inequality. That what we need to do, I believe, is to ensure that our working population, our working population is able to acquire homes through rental or purchase so that they can carry on their economic lives. And what we all know anecdotally is very large number of people of young, economically fit and able and well-qualified young people are leaving this island in droves because there are no prospects for them to be able to buy their own home. My own, my own family situation, I know that. And we're not talking about people with, you know, very low incomes. We're talking about people with modest incomes. You know, ordinary, you know, now, I believe, the latest statistical unit said is that um, I think the, 
now that there was no that no chance that a single person on their own could could effectively get a mortgage on the criteria being applied by the banks to anything else than a more than a one bedroom flat and where is the chance for them to acquire family homes and you know this, this is something which i think is crucial now okay the government would need to respond and change to that situation and that, but I, I've always said it is open to government in terms of the way it operates through the government plan to fund the capital investment of the Jersey States of Jersey Development Company to fund that directly as capital injection. It's open to them to do that. So it's not fair to say that there's no other way of doing it. It can. And I don't believe subsidy, because it's been spoken about a, a public subsidy in affordability, I don't think it is a subsidy because somebody will hold the 30%. If we're to take the minister's latest edict, which was, sorry, the, the SPG draft issued yesterday, I haven't read it. I've only had a quick scan this morning. But I noticed it said that affordable housing is defined as 70% of open market value, with the 30% being alternatively funded. I think it's open for government to provide means of doing that whereby, you know, there's not a loss because that, you know, that would be held by the developer or government. If government does develop it, they hold 30% in perpetuity. They may transfer it to somebody else, to another affordable person, but it is not, I don't think, should be reviewed as a subsidy, sir. So I think I've both got those concerns about what is, sorry, what is the, the policy implementation as explained by the government representative, and I entirely accept that what is being put across to you, sir, is very probably, you know, almost, well, will be, I, I remember, what the current government says, the way that policy works. I'm saying to you is that I don't believe that it fulfills the intention that when the states approve this policy, that would be the case. In any event, I think there's also the com technical complication of having an application that doesn't include the viability assessment, which is strongly implied if not explicitly stated as required, but it doesn't have to in a policy, I don't think. You don't have to have the procedural requirements of a policy stated in a policy. It needs to be given in guidance, but not in a policy. So I think given a permission that assumes that 15% is okay, at the present time, uh, in the absence of a viability assessment, would be wrong, sir. I'm open to respond to points because people might say I've been misrepresented. Okay, well, I'm going to let uh, Ms. Jay come back on that because you made a few uh, points um, aimed in her direction. Then I'll, I'll go to the applicants' team. So, by all means, stay there and we'll see how that unfolds. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I think starting with one of the, the first points made there is that the level of detail uh, provided in the government plan uh, not being consistent with what Mr Young would have expected to have seen relative to his prior involvement. Um, ultimately, the states have approved that government plan with the level of detail that it has. Um, the, the government plan, still being quite a large document, um, has to be uh, simple and accessible in its form, but of course the Treasury uh, and, and the Government of Jersey and States of Jersey Development Company hold a, a great deal of detail that sits behind that plan and, and underpins the budget. Um, so whilst it may not be published, and um, uh, perhaps uh, Mr Henry can come back on um, the, the, the details of the financials that have informed the position, um, that position does is trusted to exist, um, and I'll share that with you in the documentation that I've committed to share. Um, uh, but don't share anything that can't go in the public domain. Uh, no, absolutely. So two pu very public documents, so the government plan, but also the Council of Ministers report that establishes the guidance for States of Jersey Development Company yeah. to follow um, in uh, their provision of affordable homes and other community infrastructure uh, on the site. Um, <clears throat> so just, uh, just touching on some other points in the comparison of, of the affordable housing provision uh, on, on this site relative to the affordable housing sites, which are the rezoned housing sites. So again, it's quite tricky to be clear when you're talking about lots of different percentages here, but what we're talking about at the moment is a 15% is a as a proportion of the development. Um, the conversation so far hasn't strayed into the value of, of that proportion. Um, the value um, that's attached to that proportion is, is very important because it's the value that actually makes the home affordable to somebody. So whether it's a 
5% subsidy, a 10% subsidy, a 30% subsidy is actually very significant in terms of the, the, the benefit realised of having 15% of those homes um, uh, designated as subsidised affordable housing. Um, when we're dealing with affordable housing um, on rezoned housing sites, the context is very different. So that's where you have a, a green field um, that holds an agricultural value that is rezoned and a, a massive value um, uplift is realised as a result of the public decision. Um, it is, um, uh, it is, is how we have historically dealt with and in accordance with the planning and building law that those homes will be provided for. Um, uh, people who cannot access housing in the uh, open market, who have financial difficulties in doing so, um, and a portion of the value is captured to reinvest into that affordable housing. But there is, a, there is a huge scope to capture that value because of the uplift in value that's created at the moment of the island plan being approved. So the 30% in terms in value terms um, that's referenced by Mr Young is in a very different financial context or, or, or viability context than what we're dealing with with here, where the, the land has a, use, a high use value um, and is also going to be providing um, a great deal of community infrastructure as part of its delivery. So the viability constraints attached to the two different types of affordable housing are very different and therefore the policy position of the government is, it reflects that difference. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what, what further I can add uh, to this point. Um, rather than bringing it back simply down to the fact that it, it is the policy position or the policy view um, that the test of policy H5 has been met through the approval of the government plan that has been approved by the State's Assembly. Um, uh, that I would emphasise at this juncture, given that we're dealing with an outline planning application, that the, the applicant seems to be committed to this being a minimum of 15%. And that may be re-evaluated through, uh, as, as, the, um, uh, as Mr Young highlights, through successive government plans. So whilst much like the, the, how the island plan and, and outline permissions uh, function, um, the government plan will function in the same way in that it's without prejudice to the redetermination of the government plan. So um, the 15% today set in the government plan may well increase to, you know, at the will of the next state assembly to 30%. And it will be for the government to rebalance that through uh, its capital investment to basically meet the shortfall that will come. Um, so I'm not saying that won't happen. Um, that, that may well happen, and it will be at the will of the State's Assembly. Um, so uh, perhaps that can be dealt with by uh, condition on this uh, development that the, um, uh, the policy H5 position and the government plan position will have to be re-evaluated um, relative to the conditions of the decisions of the State's Assembly of the day. Um, but the, the bottom line is the 15%, the minimum 15% is established. There should be flexibility in the future to increase that okay. um, should it be needed. Okay, well, I've heard your position. And, and you're at one with the applicant that policies H5 and H6 you consider are complied with. Yes. All right, okay. Mr Young, you've got a different interpretation. Um, I'm going to go to the applicants team now you've heard a, a lot there um anything you specifically wish to respond to or do you just want to say h5 and h6 complied with uh well, probably the latter um there is no requirement for a viability assessment the control mechanism is in the policy and the control mechanism is <coughs> clearly uh as prescribed by the, the government plan that that's the control mechanism um i accept Mr. Young's uh, point, that is not where the Bridging Island Plan settled, uh, and our position is entirely consistent with um, the planning authority uh, and the evidence that um, Mrs. Day has delivered. H5 okay. and H6 compliant. Right, so if I could just um, ask a few questions just to explore this a little, little bit further, because we, we started talking about um, uh, median incomes and average household incomes. Um, Mr. I'm not sure he actually gave us a median income figure, a current one. Is, is there a, a median income figure? Um, oh, they, do, they are published, aren't they? I can come back to you in just two yeah. moments. <laughs> um, and I, I just want to understand this because I've, I've heard various comments uh, uh, in the last day and a half about £1.7 million flats and what's that going to do for uh, solving Jersey's housing problems. So are, are you able just to give me a feel based on 
uh, current market conditions of likely sales values of the notional one, two, and three bed properties? If the, um, yes, sir. So the, um, on a quarterly basis, uh, the government of Jersey produces a house price index. Um, and that's uh, uh, whilst the values um, are, um, it takes six weeks, I believe, from the quarter end to produce those reports. And those reports obviously cover a three month period. So there can be transactions that are yep. you know, five months out of uh, uh, historic. Um, but on the, on the last um, report that was produced um, quarter ending uh, December 2022, um, the average price of a one-bedroom unit um, is £383,000. £383,000. Yep. Um, I know that because I looked at it this morning. Um, but I'm just having a look at the, the other get the price of a two-bedroom unit. Um, five. Five hundred and thirty-five thousand was a uh, the average price of a of a two-bedroom unit, and it doesn't um, provide pricings on um, three-bedroom apartments. Um, but a a three-bedroom house um, had an average price of eight hundred and eighty-three thousand pounds. So I can send that report to the programme officer now. For yeah, please, thank you. The apartments we anticipate um, the the average price is being being less than that because uh, you, yeah, your, your your price of apartments generally are if you take the the, the differential between a a uh, two bedroom apartment. Um, as referenced at 535 and a two bedroom house, the average price of a two bedroom house is 635. So you do tend to see a, uh, a slightly lower price um, on, a, on a three bedroom apartment. Yeah, sure. A three -bedroom house. On, on the one and two bedders, um, I mean, would there be some sort of premium adjustment for uh, waterside location? Yes, indeed. Yes. And what, what would that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to disclose, um, you know, sales prices at Horizon or, or whatever. But um, could, could you, if you take that w one bed at uh, 383, which is a Jersey average figure from all, all transactions in that corner, what, what would you add on as a, a sort of waterside premium, assuming you can see the sea? Is it 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent? I think I think you could. Um, you, it, it would be of it would, it would be in excess of yeah. It would be between. You'd probably be in in the order of twenty percent increase, if not if not, yeah, slightly higher. Um, but there are limited units that will have those those premium C views. Yeah, and does it work the other way? Whatever the opposite of a premium is, if you were um, in the less desirable parts of the site back it onto the road or if that was your aspect um, would it be below um, the, those levels do you think well I think the the, the 383 um, obviously includes um, uh, we, what we what you don't have within this is the unit sizes of yep. those one bedroom units um, and as we know some of the um, older stock um, there's a number of uh, conversions, and, and what isn't taken into account with these figures is whether there's any refurbishment works required sure. on these properties that that, that can um, significantly add um, to that to that base purchase price. Um, but yes, you know the the aspect from from the units um, will will um, impact the, uh, the the sales price. Okay. Right. So Jersey is an expensive place to buy a property. And did we get that? Ink? I'm happy to give you the um, 
the, the linear pattern of the 2019 to 2020 figures, the statistics shares you have uh, since published an update, uh, and I do have it somewhere, um, they've expressed it as a weekly figure, and there's, there's some complications as to whether it's equivalent or non-equivalent. But I can show you the income distribution pattern for the 2020, if that's helpful to you. Well, you're saying there's more up-to-date data as well. So there? I can come back to you with... I would, I would rather have something more, more up-to-date, something cl closer to the time period of the sales values we just talked about. Yes. OK, thank you, Albert. Yes, that would be useful. Uh, OK, right. Let me open up the discussion. Mr. Young, you can stay there if you, if you, if you wish. Um, Mr. Weibar, can I swap? Thank you, sir. I think it's very important, sir, that uh, you understand that there is not just one housing supplier in Jersey. Uh, there are some big developers here who are providing a large number of units, and at the moment there's actually a glut of higher priced flats in Jersey. To give you, give you an example, the largest of the developers recently completed a set of units in Tower Hill, wonderful views over St. Ovens Bay. They've been on the market for a month and they haven't sold one. There are a number of other developers in the same position. So in fact, what we're getting on the waterfront in my view is a group of, of apartments that are not really required by the public of Jersey and people who've come into Jersey. So this idea that um, elderly people will be selling their homes to downsize into units is a good theory, but unless the prices are right, it's not going to happen. And this is what's been proving in fact. So the argument that there's a housing shortage and this is necessary to deal with it, simply doesn't work at the moment. So we're in a situation where we're, we're talking about developing a, an enormous development, probably, well, it is the biggest development we've seen in Jersey, and yet we've not been given any evidence of the need for those apartments of the type they're going to be to be available to the general public. And whilst I admire what JDC have done in many areas, um, and yes, it's right that a lot of their properties are going to first time buyers, that's only going to work providing the prices are not too high. Because even if it's a first time buyer, and even if you're going to help them with a the deposit, their mortgages are going to be so big that they're not going to be able to afford it. So you're going to get a situation where we're going to have units being developed in that particular area where the price is at a premium, because as you rightly asked, do units on the seafront attract a higher price? And yes, of course, that's the situation. Not only is that the situation, if the units are higher with good views, the prices automatically go up. What we haven't heard is what the prices are going to be in this development. And I think that's an important piece of information we're going to need. Now, I don't know why we can't have that information. I don't know whether it's confidential. But if we're going to make a decision, or if you're going to make a decision, sir, um, that's the right decision in this area, I think that we ought to know whether it's really going to be possible for young people, young married couples, to actually be able to afford what's going to go there because it's inevitable that the prices have to be good prices uh, for the kind of site that it's going to be on. We're not talking about a set of building blocks at the back of St Helia. We're talking about a prime position in St Helia, and they're going to attract a prime price. And I think that's a very important consideration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do you want to come back to that, Mr Henry? Thank you, sir. Um, the price of these properties um, will be ultimately determined at the at the point of commencing pre-sales. Um, 
that their expectations are that the that the market uh, uh, house price index that, that's coming out on on Thursday, you know, will will start to show a cooling in the market, um, and we don't know where prices will be in 2025, which will be when we will commence the pre-sales on the first um, phase, assuming um, we, we secure the necessary approvals. Those, those first uh, new homes won't actually be handed over to buyers until um, towards the end of 2027 into 2028. Um, so we're still you know, four to five years away um, from realizing and, and being able to have um, units occupied. So we, we, we do not know where the market will be at that point in time. We do not know where prices um, will be, um, but we will be constantly um, reappraising and, and assessing the, uh, the, the, the position. W with regards to the, the, the prices, and, and I don't want to repeat what I referenced earlier, sir, but the government has set out a requirement and placed an obligation on Jersey Development Company that we must only sell to owner occupiers. Furthermore, these units, the, the, the legal structure around these new apartments will be flying freehold. So they can only be owned um, by either entitled or licensed um, individuals under the, under the housing laws. So these won't be sold to investors and they will not be able to be purchased in perpetuity by anyone other than uh, locally resident uh, uh, individuals. So that, that's very important um, and ultimately means from the public's perspective that we have a finite market for these units and therefore we need, to, if we want to sell those, those units, um, we need to be sensible um, on, on the pricing. Um, and, and as I've referenced earlier, sir, as I say, to date on uh, the developments that the Jersey Development Company have delivered, 35% of those open market homes have been purchased by first time buyers. And on the horizon development that we are completing um, at the moment, it's a development of 280 apartments. Um, 276 of those apartments have been pre sold. So we only have four units remaining in that development. Sorry, the, your numbers again. Was, you were... So it's 280 apartments. 280. Um, we've, we, and we have pre-sold 276. Um, we've, we've handed over now two of the blocks. So we've handed over 196 apartments. And we've got the final uh, block of 84 uh, completing at the end of October. And just out of interest, those sales, the Horizon ones, they they don't have that same obligation in terms of qualified and entitled and flying, flying freeholds that you, you mentioned? No, that's correct, sir. So it's a share transfer um, scheme, and whilst the occupiers must be either entitled or um, licensed, um, the, the owners... Um, there isn't a restriction on the... On Could be anywhere on the globe. Correct. And on that development, 50% um, of those units um, have been purchased by owner-occupiers and 50% have been purchased by investors, by select investors, um, and of which um, nine, over 90% um, were local um, purchase investors. We have five units that were bought by overseas buyers. Well, that's interesting. So of, of that 50%, not, sorry, say that again, 50% were investors. Five, five select investors, and of which only, only five of the units um, were purchased by overseas buyers. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, Mr. McCarthy, on affordable housing. The, 
the, the common thread of my objections have been lack of information um, as objected by the planning department. And, and that uh, keeps repeating itself. The other aspect is to what level of standard should we have the information? And it's interesting that a government developer keeps saying, we don't have to provide it, so don't provide it. I think it's absolutely fundamentally important that the viability assessment is provided. Why? Because what they're saying, they're promising us, we're limiting the amount of homes that islanders can buy that's affordable in return for <coughs> public improvement projects, a swimming pool, car parks. Uh, we already have a swimming pool. We already have car parks. So that's nothing added. You haven't increased. You haven't improved. Personally, the swimming pool was worse. The present swimming pool was exposed to the sunlight uh, from sunrise to sunset. The, the, the latest proposal doesn't. The other thing about affordable homes, I think it, this whole public inquiry, what, <laughs> there's only one subject that everybody's interested on the island, apart from those who are looking forward to selling their property and leaving the island, is affordability. And it affects everything. And now I'm moving into the field of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Now, what is important is we have a developer that states that they are working in accordance to international best practice on environmental social governance. So we're not talking to a developer that is trying to provide the minimum information to the planners and the planners trying to squeeze information out of them. They should be delighted to give the viability assessment to prove to the islanders. And why? Because they don't own the land. We own the land. This land was gifted by the Queen, our late, our late Queen, Duke, for the enjoyment of islanders. The enjoyment of islanders. And they gave us the added responsibility to protect this land for the enjoyment of future generations. So, as well as we're looking at the fallibility today, and if we're looking at a chart that says this, it's only going to get worse. And when I mean lack of information, it is extremely important when one says 15% affordable homes. Does that mean the number of homes, so that's all one-bedders, or is it mixed? Is it to be divided at the end of the next 10 year, uh, 12 years? Is it to be divided at the front? It's all this fundamental information that you require, even for an outline planning application. The other aspect about affordability is energy bills. So we, in the old days, we'd probably, your mortgage was it, but now energy, whether you're renting or buying, is big, and it's going to get bigger. And I know what will happen is those flats that are facing, majority of the flats that are facing a motorway um, and uh, facing north, you won't be able to open the windows, you've got to have mechanical ventilation, and for some of them, they're going to have to have air conditioning cooling, and that's why they're putting heat rejection plant on the roof. So they've got to pay for that bill, and they're struggling just to pay, pay the mortgage. So I'm sorry, I, I think what we have is a situation where we expect, as landowners of the site gifted to us by our Queen, and, uh, and I'm sure our late Queen would probably say the same thing, what we want you to demonstrate to us, that you are providing the, the best uh, value for islanders. And I don't see, for example, when you talk about uh, affordable housing, so the public are, are not being misled. What I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I bought one of the apartments for £300,000, the developer or another would say, that's fine, give me £200,000, and I will put in another £100,000, which to me sounds like... Um, uh, but so, so when the, the house is sold, 
the priority should be it's sold to another person that needs affordable home. So it's sold to them. And the investor, the, 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 obviously the purchaser that bought the affordable home in the first place, gets their cut of the uplifted value. But so does the government. So the government isn't losing out. So it, I didn't like this idea that we're just handing cash over to those that are less fortunate. We're not. Now, the other thing is about society. I'm lucky because I had called mum's, mum and dad's bank. They bought my first contributed a third of my first property. There's a lot of people who are trying to make ends meet. They don't have mum and dad's bank, but they've got a government that should be interested in them and say, we're your bank. We'll want you to stay. We don't want you to leave. And when they leave, they leave their old mum and dad at home. So then you lose that social su support for our aging population. And this is what this is whole project's about. It's about retention of families. It's about an aging population. But let's face it, this government does not pay for the social care. It does not pay for the total health care. Families do by giving up their job and looking after mum and dad. So what I'm trying to do, uh, in a, in a, hopefully in a mature manner. This has turned out to be a conversation you expect with, a, with a, an estate agent, where when we're talking about affordable homes, we're talking about human beings that need to be considered as human beings. And it's about how can we lift them from affordable homes, which they can then expand and develop and move to their next home and then allow the next person through. It's, it's not that. And the last thing I would stress, please, you know, I start off with this, 100% should be affordable homes. And this developer should prove to us why it should be less. But furthermore, the first developments should be 100% and 100% until they reach that target. Because what we're going to see as, as they're developing that percentage as the cost of homes go up in the future, the number of affordable homes we require will grow with it. So we should start off the first developments 100% affordable homes, the second ones 100% until they hit their target, and then we can progress. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right. Um, I think we've had a good discussion on affordable housing. There's a lot for me to uh, think about and put into the report for the, the minister. Um, any final comments from the main parties before I move on? Very minor matter. So the uh, commitment of the applicant uh, is for 15% affordable housing. We are quite happy that it's broken down uh, per phase, not all left to the last minute, uh, if that was ever the intention. And we are also quite happy that, that is broken down by uh, unit type as well. So there is a um, more dynamic approach uh, across all um, type of uh, provision uh, and the standard approach is that that is secured in perpetuity through the planning obligation agreement and that's something we could pick up in the conditions right. planning right. obligations yep. session anything but right okay um, right I'm just conscious of time it's um, coming up three o'clock now and I, I want to finish off um, session five we've got a couple of um, issues. Um, health provision, I'm happy to take as read, but um, uh, if there's any contributions, I don't see much between you. I think we've had a, a witness uh, waiting nearly all day uh, on the teams. Uh, so <laughs> well, I hope they've enjoyed. They, they can probably carry on with their... their um, well, we, we are content with that position. I'll so. be guided by, by, by you. We, um, we're entirely content in relation to the timetable that uh, we are aligned on that. I mean, there, there's no policy objection from the planning authority. Um, no. no. The assessed impacts are negligible, I think, in the EIA, and there is provision of GP facilities, dentists, and, and whatever right. within the scheme. So uh, we've, we've got enough areas where there are difference of views, and I'll bank that one if we, if we can. Um, 
Okay, the other issue I wanted to talk about was employment generation. Um, and I, it's never been in planning inquiries that people always, always want to talk about the negatives, the harms, and, and the stuff. But the, what is assessed in the environmental impact assessment is in terms of employment generation. Um, obviously, there, there's a, a lot of construction jobs created uh, over quite a long period of uh, whatever it is, 10, 10 to 12 years. I think there's, there's a talk in the environmental assessment. I think they assess uh, in the peak year, it could be 520 full-time equivalents. Um, and then at the operational phase, there's an estimate of well over 1,000 additional jobs, 1,320. Uh, and that's an adjusted figure because there's 100 or so jobs on site at the moment that would be displaced. Uh, but it, it, that, that number, 1320, wouldn't be attained until 2034. But it's quite, it, it's what the EIA says, it's quite significant because it, it would amount to uh, a couple of percent of total employment in Jersey, and it's 2.1%. Uh, and as a result of all that, the environmental impact assessment uh, judges it to be a major beneficial effect, which is significant. Uh, so that's what I'm reading in the environmental impact assessment. I haven't seen any doubt or challenge to that from the planning authority. No, we, we've got no reason to question that. So we're comfortable. Okay. I wanted to just ask Mr Nicholson and maybe Mr Henry the when I look at the creation of permanent employment table in the environmental impact assessment is on page 22 and it's table 7.11 um, by far the biggest contribution to employment would be the office blocks which I think is blocks G2 and G3 um, I just wanted to ask some questions around uh, Mr. Henry. I think the very first time we met, um, we discussed the first phases of the IFC, and it was around the time when there was still this proposal on the cards of Berry in the Road, and uh, you'll, you'll recall all, all that, I'm sure. Um, I've watched over the years, my, my visits to Jersey, how the Finance Centre has unfolded. Um, but I'm interested to know, given the shifts and changes in the glo global economy and post-pandemic and working from home and uh, corporate resizing and e everything that's, that's happened, um, are the, well, let, let me be blunt. Are those blocks G2 and G3, are they going to get built? Yes. So um, we are presently on our third uh, finance centre building. Sir. And that building, the office content of that building um, is already 100% let. We are the most pre-let we've ever been at this stage on a... IFC build. So this is on which building? So this is called IFC 6, and it's helpfully the third finance centre building. Yeah. I won't go into the numbering. Um, the, the reality we find ourselves in in Jersey is that as there is no lengthy commute to the office, and as there are no overcrowded um, public transport systems, there has been very much a return to work ethos running through the vast majority of financial services businesses on the island. We also have a number of businesses um, whose um, present um, leases are coming up for expiry um, over the next um, five or so years, and we are already in in early discussions on the fourth finance centre building, IFC2. 
when we had uh, the challenges um, around um, the, the first IFC buildings, there were a number of alternative new build office schemes in the offing, um, all of which have either been built out or are now applying for a change of use to one of the large schemes is now applying for a change of use to residential. As a result of that, um, there will be in the not too distant future um, a lack of supply um, for uh, grade A office space and there is a continued migration to quality um, by businesses that are occupying physically obsolete um, tertiary or secondary office buildings. And as you'll appreciate, sir, going through a, a major refurbishment on a, an existing building and the disruption that that would have for the, uh, for the, for the sitting tenant, um, most businesses take the opportunity to uh, uh, move to a, a, a better quality um, building. Often this is combined with a need for more space as we continue to have um, consolidation and M&A &E, uh, activity within the financial services businesses themselves. So we're confident, sir, that there will be um, the continuing need uh, from a strategic perspective for the island, for its um, primary uh, uh, economic sector, as well as, and so the retention um, of those international firms um, is, is vital for Jersey's economy. We need to ensure that we've got the right provision um, for their for their future. Okay. Well, given those bullish sentiments, then. Um, we asked that question about the block on the end, given that what you were saying that um, uh, you're the most pre-let ever and you see future demand and you answered yes to my question about blocks G2 and G3. Why have you stuck a resi block right on the corner there, which is sort of at the end of the IFC? Uh, isn't that more naturally a... Um, the continuation of the IFC to sort of finish it off. I'm, I'm un wanted to understand yes. what, what is the sort of latent demand? Does it stop somewhere and does that influence your thinking? So the, the shape of that plot um, is, is, is irregular um, and the size of the floor plates are not conducive for the um, tenant requirements. They, they require floor plates of between, you know, a, well, we've got 12,000 net and turly areas on IFC 1 and 5. We're up to 15, 16,000 um, on IFC 6. Um, it's that sort of size and regular shape floor plates that, that tenants are requiring. It also provides for all, um, subdivision of those floors to, to provide for a range of, of, of space needs. So I think as... as um, we, we referenced earlier around flexibility of these proposals. Um, there has been a commitment by the council ministers that there should be a civic building um, incorporated within the scheme. Um, and, and it may well be, sir, that that uh, particular plot that you referenced could, could end up being a, a civic building in, in, uh, in, 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 as part of a future proposal. Um, and that references some of the commentary that's been uh, made around, uh, particularly around uh, the, the provision for the arts. Yes, because we, we've heard a number of people talking about that uh, sense of arrival into town and that particular triangular site, that that is going to be a potential impression maker, isn't it, as, as, you, as you arrive near? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's helpful. Um, so planning, sorry, any quick questions on jobs and economy? Yeah. Oh. Uh, just a year ago in this room, I first met uh, Mr. Vibert. Uh, 
uh, was a political speech, and uh, I couldn't, you know, I was inter interrupted. Anyway, the question to Sir Mark Bolia, who was standing for election, he came seventh, was how does a 1.7 million flat on the top of uh, Horizon solve the housing problem? How does it? Answer in turn, please. How does it solve the housing crisis? What's the answer? Uh, we, how does it solve it? We've been through an extensive discussion uh, about housing need, and as per the introductory uh, comments, I understood this was uh, now um, the session on employment generation. We've had well, questions and answers. Yeah, I was talking about, uh, we were talking about the jobs that will be created by this development. Yeah, okay. Well, that, I just want to say, <clears throat> it's the last thing I'll say, that, that model, to me, as a trained professional, is going to cover the site with um, horizons. You just look at it very carefully. It's double the size of everything around it. It's nothing to do with connecting to the town. The exact reverse. It's dividing the town from the castle, from the sea, as, as uh, Christopher said, in my opinion. I understand that, sir. OK. Thank you. The survivor. So, specifically on jobs and employment. Thank you. Yes, so, I think the question of uh, the amount of employment that this is going to cause, under normal circumstances, would be welcomed. But in Jersey, we have a very real problem. And the problem is getting somewhere for people to live who come to Jersey. The building industry, even though we've had a couple of building failures, uh, it would appear to be mainly because of the way they've quoted on, on big jobs. Uh, you know, there's a situation where you can't get people to do jobs because there are just not enough of them. And once people start to come to Jersey, and I think that's what's going to have to happen, we're going to have to get skilled people in to come here, even though I realise this is going to be done over a long period of time. It is going to increase the amount of skilled people who are going to have to come to Jersey, and they're going to have to be housed, and they're going to meet local girls, and they're going to get married, and they're going to have children. And it happens in every walk of life in Jersey, which is one of the problems that we face, which is pop population growth. So instead of being a plus, it should be looked at as being a difficult problem that's going to have to be solved. Thank you. Thanks. Mr Young. I think only one question, sir. Obviously, the always issue about office provision is whether or not this is new entrance to the market i.e. from outside the island generating new jobs or whether the relocations to the waterfront are relocations whereby enterprises that are operating in kind of um, secondary office space and tertiary office space in St Elia just merely move and outside. So I just wonder, is the plan based on dependent upon expansion of new, uh, new businesses coming into or businesses coming into the island to generate jobs in the way you phrase it or is it just merely providing accommodation for jobs that are already here I suppose that you know because that's important it seems to me because the question arises the market will probably determine if this is approved um, what would happen to that site uh, what you know what uses would be posed what's the plan B if the offices don't get uh, if, the, if the market demand doesn't go, two questions, I suppose. No, I, I, you know, I suspect that Mr. Henry confirmed that it's probably too early to say, isn't it, in terms of whether it's new businesses or those relocating, might be a bit of both, and it's going to be market led, isn't it? But I think the past would show us, because obviously we've had experience of the other the other um, finance centre offices. We can base it on that. Can't we? Is there any reason to expect anything different? 
Thank you, sir, for May. Um, it's a, Mr. Young um, poses a very uh, interesting and, and valid point. Depending on what end of the telescope you want to view this from, it's either very positive or very negative in terms of the, the, the total number that's been set out here. And, and I, that number has been based on the occupancy of these new office buildings. However, as Mr. Young rightly points out, there will be a number of occupiers that will be relocating from currently substandard accommodation. What we don't know, however, is whether that substandard accommodation will be, will be refurbished and relet to incoming businesses, for example. So we just can't tell whether it would be converted to residential as a number of um, obsolete officers have, have done so over the, uh, over the recent period. So we've sort of presented the, the upper end in terms of impact, if you like, um, but it, it's likely to be uh, lower than that due to the, the netting off um, because of relocations. Thank you. Thank you. Good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Well, I think that uh, brings session five to uh, a close. Um, I suggest we take a short break now. We'll take 10 minutes till 25 past ju just after. And then we've got a fairly hefty session on uh, amenity to uh, come up. With. Could I, just before we break, could I just check with Mr Nicholson? Who, 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 who are you fielding on this? Uh, we've, we've got two, uh, two specialists. Uh, we've got um, uh, Joe from RWDI. He is a technical specialist has made submissions uh, in relation to the uh, situation uh, for wind. Uh, and we have uh, Ian uh, McKenna from Hollis, who has uh, made uh, submissions in relation to uh, uh, sunlight, uh, daylight. Um, and you would have seen his uh, proof, I'm sure, yes. on, on those yeah. points. Uh, the balance of the uh, matters um, I, I will cover off. OK. Um OK, let's have 10 minutes.
Okay, if we could um, resume now then, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, okay, last session of the day. It's quite a wide-ranging one, and we are discussing the, uh, the issue of amenity. Um, I'll say that. It, it is very wide-ranging. We've got some uh, uh, titles here, issues that we need to cover. Firstly, occupiers beyond the site boundaries, so neighbour impacts. Uh, and then we need to look at the amenity issues for future occupiers of these uh, uh, 984 dwellings. Uh, and there's a, a number of issues we need to look at there in terms of internal space standards, sunlight, daylight, overshadowing, general activities. Uh, we need to get privacy in there as well, privacy and, and overlooking. Um, that should have been on the list originally. Um, OK, and we'll go back to the conventional running order on, on this. We'll go to the uh, applicants team, for, first of all. Um, and, well, actually, I, I might be able to knock off the, uh, the first one uh, very quickly. Uh, I understand it's sort of common ground that in terms of assessed impacts on uh, neighbouring properties, I believe that the applicant and the planning authority are at one that uh, there are no unreasonable impacts. Is that true? Uh, I think that's our position, sir. Um, of course. Um, of course I think uh, well, having had a look at the model, um, we don't know, of course, how accurate the model is or might be. Um, I think we might just be one to raise a couple of points about the relationship of the new blocks on the, the current horizon development, because the, the model uh, places uh, certain blocks, um, E2 and E3, uh, what appears to be extremely close to the, uh, you know, the northeastern boundaries of the um, northeastern elevation, sorry, of the new horizon blocks. and. Um, if that is indeed the case, then I think there's uh, quite a tight relationship between the existing and the new in terms of potential overlooking privacy, um, loss of light, etc. But we don't know how accurate the model is. Um, so, whereas we might have agreed in principle, I think just perhaps want to raise those two issues. Okay, right. Well, we better do this in greater depth because I. Well, I, th I think there's two areas. Um, one um, w that I've focused on, I think somebody mentioned it the, uh, the other day, which is, uh, is it, what's it called, Marina, Marine, is it Marina Gardens or Marina Court? Marina Court. Marina Court, Marina Court. Marina Court. yeah. Um, I've had a look at that on a few occasions. Um, Remarkably understated, ten-story building. It it, uh, it is. It is. I've noticed it a, no, a number of times. It doesn't shout out at you and uh, it sits a little bit back yeah. in terms of the building. Um, yeah. I went um, last night. I, I went and stood uh, directly in the middle, looking at it, its main aspect, and appreciate I was. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't go up to the, uh, the, the the higher levels, but as you stand there in front of it. It looks directly at the Radisson Hotel. You're looking in, into that, so it isn't um, a the the block opposite it, which I think will be block C1. Um, yes, that's that's right. I mean, it's not been raised by the planning authority as as an issue, and I'll just uh, see if uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Jones are you. Have you any particular issues with um, that residential property? Um, no, on the face of it, that, that no. seems to be quite a distance away and across a you know, number of lanes of road as well. So. Okay. And the one I didn't see coming was you... I had walked around exactly where you mean, actually. Um, you're, you're talking about blocks E2 and E3. Yeah. Um, 
and they are well they're sort of to the east-ish uh, of the the triangular uh, horizon block aren't they um, and would, would your concern apply to block D2 as well uh, yes I think so sorry yes I should have mentioned that but that okay but we've got the distance so it's across a road there isn't it the, it's it's across a road, but as I say, the model <laughs> um, makes it appear as though it's... I know the model's only a um, block model, if you like, but it does make it appear closer. And, of course, the horizon has... You have the eastern, northeastern um, elevations of those properties with, with, yeah, with balconies, um, windows. Um, so, yeah, that's just a, an area okay. with, with well, question. <laughs> I was hoping to tick off an easy first <laughs> topic there, but uh, I think um, let's go to the, uh, the applicants' uh, team to uh, say what they wish to say on this, this, this issue. Who, who's going to take this, Mr Nicholson? Oh, well, I will start with the, the, the general uh, approach to uh, amenity, as I read it in the island plan. Uh, I won't be delve into uh, specific issues, but I hope to kind of set, set the scene. Uh, just for uh, clarity, um, we have uh, just got a measurement uh, across the road at uh, Rue de Leteau from uh, a generally kind of uh, midpoint across D2, E2, E3 in the relationship with uh, Horizon buildings. Uh, it's 17.8 metres from the face of the, the, yeah, that's face, face of the building. The yeah, face of E2 to the uh, easternmost horizon block. So that, that's pretty much the tightest point, actually, I think. So is is that the tightest point? It looks like it would be with E2, is it? Yes, that's E2 to the, the eastern horizon block. Um, the others are more... Uh, it increases to sort of 22. So, so that's literally the, the northern point uh, on, on the two uh, elevations of horizon. Uh, uh, and that's the... the tightest point. Um, I think we have just got the development parameters uh, plots drawing up as well, so um, which we can't share, but I'm sure you've you've got access to it. Yeah, let me just let me just find it. That's uh, drawing ten, uh, the uh, development plot plan, and we have had a conversation uh, previously about um, grain, about. Uh, the road hierarchy uh, in sessions yesterday on, on Townscape um, and we can look around the um, elements of the proposals which are not with uh, sorry, so the element of the waterfront estate which is not within our um, our red edge and the, uh, the, the grain around Horizon it's, itself between, between the buildings between Horizon and uh, Castle Quay uh, between Castle Key Phase 1 and 2, between the Harbour Reach building and uh, Castle Key. Uh, we've also got uh, relationships um, in Victoria and Albert between the, the, the two blocks on, on, on the pier. Um, the distances uh, across Rue de Leteau between Horizon and E2, even at that pinch point, are a significant, um, significantly wider arrangement than is common around the grain of the area, uh, I, I would say uh, for, for certain, sir, even bearing in mind the vertical size of those buildings. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a, another look on my walkabouts there, but... Um... OK. Uh, just in terms of uh, setting the scene for um, yeah. consideration of points of amenity, um, I think the key policy test, uh, the island plan touches on it in a few places, but the key test is within policy GD1, and that sets out um, in, in one of its clauses uh, that uh, developments should not unreasonably harm the amenities of occupants and neighbouring uses, and in particular, uh, 
uh, will not create a sense of overbearing or impressive enclosure, unreasonably affects the level of privacy uh, to buildings and land that owners and occupiers might expect to enjoy, or unreasonably affect the levels of sunlight and daylight to buildings and land that owner, owners and occupiers might expect to enjoy, and uh, adversely affects the health, safety and environments of users by virtue of emissions, such as light, noise, vibration, dust and odour. Uh, we've got a comprehensive environmental impact assessment uh, which uh, reviews uh, all those points uh, and that is synchronised with the design and access statement that talks about the approach to scale, form and grain, which we reviewed yesterday. So um, I often refer to these um, issues in, in appeals and there is a... Um, an element of Jersey case law, uh, which is, is consistently uh, referred to, which the, the planning statement again uh, touches on. So the, the, the policy framework, it, it, the wording is, is deliberate uh, and it is carried forward from the previous uh, item plan. Uh, and so it has some um, kind of pedigree in, in, in the way it approaches these issues. Uh, and it, it is nuanced uh, in, in two clear ways. The, the tests are unreasonable harm, and that accepts that there is a, uh, an element of harm which may be within a policy tolerance. It doesn't, um, it doesn't prescribe where that is, uh, and, and it requires a, a judgment to be made, but there is a clear acknowledgement that the process of change, which is considered through uh, the planning application the assessment process, that change um, may result in harm, and some harm is within a policy tolerance. The second test is, is a, a relative one. It requires a judgment against the amenities that owners and occupiers might expect to enjoy. Now, those terms, as I've set out in the planning statement, th those terms are, are, are deliberate. The, the relative test of the amenities that owners and occupiers might expect to enjoy has been examined in uh, case law, uh, in royal court judgments, which uh, we, we know in the New Jersey planning sense as uh, Winchester uh, for a site in, in Sion next to the, uh, the chapel, and Boyle. Uh, Susan Boyle uh, brought a royal court case as a litigate in person in respect of the Metropole Hotel scheme um, in uh, half the part. Those judgments placed a significant emphasis in considering the amenities that occupiers might expect to enjoy. It placed a significant emphasis on the strategic layers of planning policy that focused new development into the built-up area. The Royal Court explained to both those uh, uh, litigates that um, the plan of the, strat uh, the strategy of the island plan will Im implicitly involve a, a, a change in amenities within the built-up area, and that um, the, the, the residents uh, must have a, uh, a relative approach to uh, the, the value of amenities within the context of the public uh, strategy for delivering new development focused into the built-up area. Uh, both those uh, appeals were, were dismissed, with the Royal Court finding uh, the same, uh, that in considering relative amenities, you must consider the strategy uh, of the plan, which we've been through um, in pretty much every session that we've had. It's my submission, uh, sir, that the plan seeks to double the rate of housing delivery. Uh, we have uh, debated that uh, this morning. Uh, we have a um, embedded uh, requirement in the plan to uh, make provision for 4,000 new homes. Uh, we've touched on the um, commentary that, that uh, the then Deputy Young included in the foreword to the plan explaining that uh, from the perspective of the State's Assembly when it, when it was uh, debated. Uh, we also have the... Uh, discussion of the urban character appraisal and we have the South Western Helia framework 
as a um, uh, th three key key documents that, that set that strategy. I am firmly of the opinion that consideration of amenities following the judgment of Winchester and Boyle must be understood in that context. Um, so we um, have been through the uh, approach with the environmental impact assessment, setting out the, uh, the, the technical approach. Uh, but that represents my um, my review of the uh, kind of fundamental policy tests, um, which are are both um, accepting that some harm is within a tolerance and uh, setting a relative test. Uh, of uh, expectations in the context of the wider plan strategy. Can I just, would it be okay to come back yeah, on that? Please. And in terms of the case law that you refer to, does that precede the Bridging Island Plan? It, it does. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the, the, it refers to policy GD1, where the wording was exactly the same. Uh, and in my view, uh, given the strategy of the Bridging Island Plan, uh, particularly the requirement for doubling the rate of housing delivery and the manner that that is expected to, to occur, uh, that uh, the Bridging Island Plan uh, probably places uh, a, a, an enhanced emphasis on uh, the strategic approach uh, to uh, delivering new development in that manner. And therefore, it is even more relevant in the context of the new policies. I think I would just come back and say that I don't think the housing need um, is a point of disagreement, but the Bridging Island Plan in the introduction to the housing chapter does make reference to the importance of the island's built-up areas um, being important for higher density of development. But there is, however, a balance to be struck between the drive to use land more intensively, delivering the numbers of much-needed new homes, while still creating successful places where people can live healthy lives. And um, I think health, well-being are, are important aspects that uh, should be given equal consideration. I have no disagreement in finding that balance, sir. Yeah, we're, we're also um, acutely aware of the, you know, yeah, the policy uh, tests in GD1, excuse me, <coughs> in terms of unreasonableness. And we're also aware of the uh, minister's t desire to improve the residential space standards in his, in his draft SPG um, to try and uh, offset um, those concerns we've had on unreasonableness in, in schemes in the past. So, yeah, we, we understand the housing need elements, but we also understand the other the counter policies about unreasonableness and, and those tests to make sure a scheme, residential scheme, is going to work in those respects as well. Oh, fully accepted, sir. And, Mr Lindsay, you... In another place, we rehearsed these issues fairly recently. Um, policy H1 is also relevant, isn't it, in terms of amenity considerations? I, I think this is touched on in, in several places. In some <coughs> of the, um, uh, I'm sure the, the, the department will will pick these points out. It's in some of the strategic policies in relation to, the, to placemaking. And there, there is a, you know, a strong desire to deliver um, you know, high-quality environments. Uh, it, it appears, uh, I think it's linked into some of the uh, island identity uh, policies. It's in the uh, design, housing design, the uh, GD6 as well. But yes, I think it is um, linked into, um, in the way you, you said, uh, policy uh, H1 as well. Thank you. Well, just in terms of trying to tick off a few issues here, um, we dealt quickly with uh, impacts on occupiers beyond the site and understand the point Mr Jones made, and I understand what, what you said about the distances, and that's helpful. Uh, I've understood your introduction on amenity issues, and uh, you appreciate I'm fairly well versed in, in, in that from... Uh, plan, planning appeal work and including the uh, the cases you refer to. Um, with the, the list we've got on the programme, the, the first item under amenity for future occupiers uh, relates to internal space standards. And I mean, my, my reading of the situation here is that Jersey is 
sort of tracking what's happening in, in England in terms of the, in, in England there is the what's called the nationally described space standard uh, and that sets out minimum internal uh, sizes for different elements uh, of a dwelling, a flat or, or, or a house. Uh, and it's been pretty universally applied now in uh, English authorities. I don't think um, the SPG that's produced here, it's not exactly a cut and paste, but it looks very similar in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the floor spaces. Uh, and I think this was one uh, where Mr Coates indicated that this is likely to be in effect at the point of the, the decision. So, um, Mr Nicholson, uh, the EIA, we, we, we talked about the mix that was assumed. Um, can you point me to anywhere where I'm able to take that mix, apply the minimum space standards in the SPG and be comforted that the building envelopes within those parameters will accommodate that 984 units. Now, if that doesn't exist um, in a convenient place, it might be useful if it did because, um, well, you can understand why, um, this is the, uh, the Minister's SPG, which based on what Mr Coates says he's going to adopt uh, and I wish to be able to advise the Minister that the mix is such and such, so many one beds, so many two beds, so many three beds um, and it's been demonstrated that within the parameters shown on the drawings that is uh, achievable. Um, and if it's achievable with a buffer or a margin, so much the better, because that uh, would comfort the minister that the 984 is not um, pushing at the maximum parameters, uh, that there is a bit of slack in there to cope with design and um, placemaking and uh, call, it, call it what you will. D do I make sense in what I'm saying there? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I think the so the, the illustrative floor plans that were submitted they are they obviously illustrative only, but uh, my understanding is that the, the unit layouts have been based on minimum space standards and and that, that shows the the total number of units overall. Um, I can double check on that with the the architects. Um, yes, it would be useful because. Um, I'm not sure I ever saw the floor, sp the gross floor spaces for the residential blocks. It may, <laughs> may be in this mass of documentation anywhere, but um, it, it, it doesn't matter. Wh whichever, say we've got a residential block which has a gross uh, floor space of whatever thousand square, square metres, and that's got within it a, a mix of one, two and three beds. I want to be able to say to the Minister that evidence has been provided that demonstrates that the quantum of dwellings indicated in the development description when you apply his space standards uh, that it, yep. it, it all fits. Yep. My, my understanding is exactly as uh, Patrick explained that, that this was uh, indeed part of the um, uh, process that the architectural team went through. Uh, we have the uh, gross floor space situation per block. Uh, we have the unit mix. It would be, in my thinking, please correct me if you've got a different uh, approach, we could multiply those up, apply a gross to net uh, figure and, and uh, set out um, the, uh, how, how close they are in relation to um, that rule of thumb um, uh, approach. Um, we had the architects yesterday who may be able to have provided a bit more yes, detail I than that. I think it can be quite high level. Yep. Um, it, you know, it, do, it doesn't have to be <laughs> um, down to the last square metre, but you, you will, you, you know, with Mr Henry's uh, experience of other developments nearby, yep. you'll have a pretty good feel for gross to net and you should yep. be able to uh, de demonstrate that. And I'm sure the working, working's out of there, but uh, we'll get that I, to you. I think if they... I'm not sure if the planning authority... Apply their minds to, to that. Have, have you done those 
calculations? No, I haven't done them, but I have requested them. Um, and it was just the response was that they meet minimum standards, but I don't. But for yeah. example, with the minimum standards of one bedroom, there's one standard for one occupant and another standard for two occupants. And then we have okay. the, the change in standards, which for a one bed, there's been an increase in 16% of residential space. So it would be good to, to have that schedule to understand how it sits with the updated um, residential space yes. standards. I, I mean, I'll just give you a little bit of input from, from the UK. I think when Nashi described space standards first appeared, I think lots of developers bristled. And thought, well, why are you micro, micromanaging our product uh, uh, government? But I, I think the more, as more and more councils have uh, rolled it out, um, it seems to be pretty much accepted now. And uh, when you actually see it in practice, um, particularly at the smaller end of the drug, it actually does make a difference to what some of the accommodation I've seen the private sector provide over the years, particularly in, well, particularly in London, uh, where it can get very, very small. Um, okay, thanks. Well, that, that would be useful. That, that will help me on that. That's uh, a bit of... Uh, uh, arithmetic reporting I, I need to do in, in, the, in the report. Okay. Um, right. Now, if we move on then to sunlight, daylight and overshadowing. Now, this is quite a complex area. And, of course, we are dealing with a scheme which is all matters reserved. But we do have the, uh, the report. It's by Hollis, isn't it? Uh, um, We're just getting our uh, witness... Available uh, through Teams. This is Mr. McKenna, is it correct? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? We, we can. You're loud, loud and clear. Um, okay, Ms. Mr. McKenna. Um, are, are you going to um, just? Give a, a quick summary of the work you, you've undertaken and your, your findings. Yes, that's what I was planning to do. Well, the, the floor is yours, so please. please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian McKenna. I'm a director and head of Rights of Light and Daylight at Hollis Global. Um, I have a BSc Honours degree in Building Surveying and I'm a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Um, I prepared and submitted a proof of evidence and, <coughs> excuse me, the scope of that evidence looked at two things. So um, firstly, it was the uh, daylight and sunlight amenity potential for future occupiers of the proposed development. And secondly, it was the potential effect of the proposed development on the existing surrounding buildings which are in um, residential use. Um, in, in doing that, um, we, we had consideration to Jersey planning policy, some of, the, um, some of the parts that have just been discussed in terms of DG, uh, GD1, uh, design for homes and policy H1, all of which uh, have some references to daylight, sunlight, overshadowing and amenity. Um, we, we've also considered National Planning Policy Framework, NPPF 2021, and while I appreciate that doesn't apply in Jersey, it, it does have some useful authority on um, how the matter of daylight and sunlight should be balanced off against the need for residential development. Um, the analysis that we undertook involved setting up an accurate 3D model of the existing site and surrounding buildings and then importing the architect's proposed development model into that and we've undertaken a series of tests tests in accordance with BRE report BR209 which is um, um, site layout planning a guide to good practice the um the 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 guide is, is widely used and, and most authorities have reference to it or, or consider its targets to be um, the most suitable set of metrics really for benchmarking uh, both um, 
future light availability and proposed development and also impact on existing surrounding buildings. But it's important to note that the numeric targets within the BRE guide are not mandatory and, and they're purely advisory and best practice and it's fairly commonly accepted that in urban locations where higher densities are, are, um, are, are, are proposed, it's not always possible to meet those numeric targets. The guide was predominantly developed for setting standards for suburban housing, and therefore there is a bit of a clash between uh, the rigid application of its of its numeric targets and what can be achieved in in urban development. Um, so some of the, the the key tests we've undertaken um, in relation to the proposed development is facade mapping to work out the uh, quantity of light which will fall on the facade. This is an initial high level appraisal which um, can be done at you know early stages of design to give indications, but it doesn't dictate the light levels within the completed development because uh, the room layouts, window sizing, um, and and the layouts of the units more generally uh, will um, will it influence the 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 actual outcome in terms of of, of daylight in future development. Uh, we've also uh, considered the the um, sort of ratio of of northern facing units, uh, and that's touched upon in the proof of, of evidence. And we've looked at overshadowing of the proposed amenity spaces in the in the development. So the um, courtyards at ground level and on the podiums and at roof level, so that we can get a feel for the outdoor amenity space quality for future occupiers. Um, in, in relation to the um, surrounding existing buildings, we've looked at Marina Court, at the Victoria Place buildings and the Horizon buildings, which were discussed just now. Um, and we've undertaken daylight and sunlight tests to those buildings to determine uh, the impact of the proposed developments on those existing those uh, buildings which are being uh, developed at the moment. In summary, um, the, the findings for impact on proposed buildings are um, pretty positive, really, given again the urban location and the, the size of the development contemplated. So the um, the VSC um, and daylight distribution results are between sort of 66 and 90 percent pass rates, and the sunlight results are um, averaging at 91 percent. So that's again quite a reasonable outcome for an urban location. Again, as touched on in the proof of evidence, there are some mitigating factors which should be considered when looking at the effects of development on existing buildings. Uh, the, the main ones really, uh, I think, relevant in this case are the relative heights of the buildings. So the BRE suggests that where buildings are similar heights, um, that should be your sort of starting point for whether or not impacts are reasonable. And also the design of the surrounding buildings where they have balconies or and or rather uh, niches and um, re-entrant corners, this, uh, th this accentuates the effects of other development and if not taken into consideration can, um, you know, can, can blight the potential for development land to be uh, fully developed. So um, I think in summary, my, my view is that in relation to the facade mapping on the proposed buildings and the amenity areas, the results are positive. There's a lot of yellow, which means there's a lot of large proportions of the facade will have excellent light quality. Uh, and that's because of the open prospects really from those buildings in several directions. There are some pinch points, of course, but Having looked at the layouts of the not the, the flat layouts, but the the the, the um, individual unit locations, many of many of these have dual aspects. So they're situated on corners, and and one um, one aspect is is less affected. Uh, and also, 
um, a lot of the lower level, the ground level usage is non-residential, and that's where most of the darker colours are, which indicates that um, it, because the same immunity requirements aren't applied to commercial and retail uses and those sorts of things, that, that shouldn't be a concern. And then, and then just again on the impact on the surrounding buildings, given the sort of similarities of height and some of the other mitigating factors, um, I conclude that, um, that, that the proposals as they are um, set out at the moment don't cause unreasonable harm. Uh, furthermore, of course, these are parameters and therefore um, during detailed design, there will be opportunities to improve um, the outcomes both internally for the, for the future occupiers and also in relation to the surrounding buildings where um, you know, sort of shaping of the proposals in, in, in the right places will be able to mitigate uh, any impacts found there. So, that, so that's my summary of um, of our findings and the work we've done to date. So I'll hand back to you if I may. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I understand the planning authority you've got some concerns that you've identified on sunlight and daylight. You know, it's in your proof, isn't it? Yes. Do you want to just run through those? Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Ian. Um, this is Wendy Johnston from the Planning Authority. Um, I'll just start by saying I'm not an expert on daylight and sunlight, so um, I'll just run through um, the concerns that we had in questions, really, and hopefully you can um, provide some clarity for us. So um, we'd had a look at the vertical sky component facade study that you had helpfully provided um, as part of the application. Um, and I note your reference to the Brie guidance, which says that basically a VSC of 27% or above, then that could accommodate a conventional window design and will usually allow reasonable daylight to enter the rooms. A VSC between 15 and 27% requires larger windows and changes to the room layout are usually needed to allow adequate daylight and a VSC of between 5 and 15 percent, it's very difficult to provide adequate daylight unless very large windows are used. Um, and then Appendix B of the Hollis Daylight and Sunlight Study, which was the separate study provided, includes the visuals to assist in, in understanding that. Um, and so I guess I was interested to know so uh, there's a, a legend or a key down the side of the two diagrams which provide views from the south proposed and views from the north and in yellow we have the 27 the vsc of 27 um, down to the dark blue purple which is zero and then next to that are percentage calculations or, or just percentage figures um, what do those percentages relate to? What do they mean? Um, the, the, so those are percentages of the overall facade area. So um, the, the, it's banded at 2% increments on vertical sky component. And the, um, the, the, at the top of the yellow, it's, it's anything up to 40%. So, um, it, it, that would be the highest possible vertical sky component, and then as it as it as it goes down through the colours, through red to, to to purple to blue, those are the percentages, are the proportion of the facades that that achieve those vertical sky components. So, are those percentages unique to the scheme? Then, so for example, where we have yellow. Um, the 27, we have 54.21%. Is that saying that 54.21% of the facade shown on the images is, is, has 27% or above? Uh, has well, it's, it's, 20, of it's above 27, so it's between 27 and 40%. So, um, the, so what that's sort of saying is that 54% of the facades achieve somewhere between 27% and 40% VSC. 
Okay, so then if we go down to the bottom of the scale where there's zero light or vertical sky component, we have 22% as zero. So is that 22% of the facades of the scheme will get no natural daylight? No, that's not correct. So the, basically, it, it, the, it, it's a bit misleading. The, 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 um, the, the images are... Um, should be um, qualified. So the um, the roofs are all shown in yellow. So again, because of the the key, one would think that they're included in the assessment, but they're not. It's only the vertical facades that are included in the area percentages. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, even though the roofs, the horizontal surfaces, the roofs and podiums and what have you, are all shown in the same colour. Um, the, the, if you look closely at the coloured images, you, you won't see any of that blue colour or that dark blue colour. There are some sort of purple areas in the pinch points between the um, between the gables and, and the, the blocks opposite. So D2, for example, the, the, the gables from block D1 uh, against uh, which uh, are next to D2. Um, if you look closely, you can see some some red, red and purple in the bottom corner of D2, but none of the, the blue. So the 22% the is actually um, the, uh, the, the the roof area, which um, can be ignored because it's not, it obviously won't have windows in. So um, it's just the, uh, the, the way it's described in, in, in the key. It um it bumps all of the horizontal areas into the into the into the zero category because it's 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 not relevant for the assessment. So I think the key message here is that is the colours that we need to look at, and the key is only indicative. And again, there's that that twenty two percent is is the horizontal areas which um which should be ignored for the purposes of 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 getting a handle on the on, on the light levels on the facade it's the colors which are the important um the important guide in this set in, in this kind of appraisal which uses these um you know these color codes as opposed to the key okay okay i guess in simple terms, looking at the colours, <laughs> um, there are quite a few uh, frontages which which do have this purple colour. Um, so if we look at block E1 that fronts onto the leisure building, that features a lot of the, well, no yellow on that frontage. So it doesn't meet the Brie guidance. Just looking at the crude, crude information, I, I appreciate it's indicative. And then as you move down the scheme, and this is on the view from the south if you as you move down the scheme all of the south facing I guess um flankages frontages as you move down are all in that purple color and when we looked at the indicative um floor plans a, a lot of these are single aspect units so it was just to really what we'd hoped for was some clarification as to the pot potential number of units that might fall below the 27 um, percent, if it's a percentage, sorry, the VSC of 27, and really the number that fell below 15. Um, I don't know if there's any way to provide that, an approximate number of units. Yeah, I mean, I, there's not in unit numbers, but in terms of the relative areas of facade, the, um, the, Broadly speaking, between 27 and 40, there's about 55%. And between 15% and 27% VSC, there's um, about 27% of the facade is that colour. And, you know, so, so that would be um, the, the, in my view, above 15%, it is possible to, you know, have adequate daylight in those rooms. So 55% and 27% is um 82 percent of the facade would be um would, would would be able to receive sufficient daylight um with larger windows 
so, so where necessary, of course, because a lot of that is is will receive very good daylight in any case. Uh, so given the usual design of these types of units where the main living room would have you know, a patio door or a large window, it's, it's that suggests to me that over 80 percent um, will um, will will provide um, reasonable daylight. The the proportion between five percent and fifteen percent is fourteen percent of the facade area. Now, uh, yes, it, as the BRE says, it's it you know it it would require um, you know special measures such as larger windows in that category. And, and that leaves four percent below, um, four percent of the facade area below five percent VSC. But again, we must bear in mind that um, uh, some of that um, facade area, because it's it's mapped down to ground level, will apply to um, non-residential uses, and therefore. Uh, it suggests that the vast majority, sort of ninety percent of the facade area, will be uh, suitable for um, habitable uses. You know, just with just ensuring the detailed design, make sure that room positioning and window sizing is is suitable. That you know that stands out from the images where you know it correlates with the vast majority of being yellow. I think um, uh, th there was reference to block E1 and the what would be the sort of south eastern facade of that, but which is opposite block F1. And again, unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't come out too well in these in in the PDF color images. But that that isn't um, th th that it, th th that's sort of shadow that's cast on that from the from the um, software um, rendering. So a, a lot of that facade, for example, mm -hmm. would be yellow and therefore in the category of 27% to 40% VSC. It, it's it, it, these these high level um, render color assessments are, um, you know, don't um, don't really clearly show, show show because they're limited by the fact that they're printed, you know, and and, and reproduced, and therefore you have these um, these shadows. Another good example of that is looking from the south again, A1. So the the nib on the left hand side of A1 that that's render shadow cast on there. That's not a, a true depiction. The only way we could look at this. Um, with great clarity would be to open it up in AutoCAD and have the 3D model there, which would um, get rid of these, these shadows that are cast by the um, by, by the rendering as it's as it as it's printed. Thank you. That's that's useful. So so basically, fifteen percent. Uh, sorry, eighteen percent of the units will be fifteen percent VSC or below. And in terms of balconies then, um, or any other external additions to the units, any wind mitigation measures that might require additions to the frontages, those would also impact that uh, level of daylight to the properties. They, they, they would have to be carefully designed, yes, to ensure that um, any, any impact was limited. So that could be staggering of balconies to prevent um, a balcony soffit being above a, a room below if it were a you know key habitable room like a living room. Uh, so yes, that would be um, that would need to be considered at detailed design stage to avoid um, creating further um, obstructions to light in areas where uh, light levels are lower um, and. You know, conversely, uh, a lot of the facades would have very high levels of light, so consideration would be need need to be given to balancing that off as well, so they're not too bright. Thank you. So, um, 
My next comment was in terms of sunlight amenity as, um, associated with the proposed open spaces. Um, sorry, just, just before oh, we, we move on, if, if, you, if you don't mind, uh, uh, this is really complex stuff. Yeah. And if we, if, we, if we move too quick, uh, my questions will be all over the place. Um, could I just ask um, a question? And it just builds on uh, the question of Ms. Ms. Johnson there, where, where she was referring to uh, the... Uh, the, the image on page 16 of the assessment and uh, she, she was uh, highlighting where, pardon the pun, um, the, where you've got those darker purple colours between blocks. Um, is, is in locations like that, I mean clearly I can see that there is scope uh, on some of the corners there that they could be uh, dual aspect but in the middle of the blocks there, in those purple areas, if you were to have a single aspect dwelling in uh, those uh, darker pur purple colours, am, am I right in saying that um, what, what your report is saying is that really didn't, you can't mitigate that with bigger windows? Um, you, 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 you can to a degree. I mean, it would depend on the specifics and the precise location and the, the, the light levels available at that location. But um, that, so it would, it would be a question of you know, the use, whether it's residential or non-residential. Then it would be a question of the layout of the unit. So if you look in the corner of D1, for example, looking from the south, if we're still looking at that image, um, you know, one wouldn't put the the main living room window right in the corner for you know a because the lights lower there and b because it would lead to overlooking issues or privacy issues. So it would come down to the um, the the layout of the flat, uh, the use in those particular areas, whether it's residential or non-residential, then the window sizing. Then there were also some other aspects which would come into it would be um, things like the um, the internal finishes and the external finishes on the ground and on the other blocks. So in um, typically where you have these courtyard type arrangements, we would advocate light coloured reflective finishes so that externally reflected light would um, offset uh, the lower levels of direct light. So there are a host of detailed design measures that can be brought into play at the appropriate time to optimise light in, in, every, in every location, depending on the characteristics of that location. So um, again, it, it comes down to reserve matters or detailed design and making sure that, um, that these things are given consideration and that there's um, you know, there's, there's uh, the, the, you know, the will to ensure that there is that optimization. The, the vertical sky component is a very basic as a, an analysis. It just measures direct view of sky. It's as simple as that. And, and um, you know, even when there's a relatively low direct sky uh, visibility, it's still possible to design for adequate daylight by utilising those other factors which you know which this simple assessment doesn't take into account so it's it it it, it doesn't mean because there are areas which get below 27 or 15 percent vsc that they won't be adequately lit that's a common um th those are common vsc levels and through careful um careful detail design those matters can be um, improved and mitigated and optimised. Thank you. I'll hand back to Ms Johnson. Carry on. Thank you. In terms of sunlight amenity within the proposed open spaces, um, the study notes the Bree guidance recommendation that at least half of an open space being tested should receive at least two hours of direct sunlight and, I, and I've um, gone with the 21st of March um, assessment that was done. Um, 
So basically, at least two hours of direct sunlight on 21st of March if the space is to appear adequately sunlit throughout the year. And that's paragraph 3.2.3 of the, the daylight and sunlight study. Um, Appendix D to the study quantifies the spatial percentage of amenity space that will meet this guidance. Um, and I guess of particular concern to us were the core private communal um, amenity spaces within the blocks. So we have plot A1. There is the open space area within that courtyard area um, where only 9% of that space will meet the BREE criteria. We have plot C1 where 18% of the space will meet the BREE criteria. Plot D1, 26% of the space will meet the BREE criteria. And plot E1, 16% of the space will meet the BREE criteria. Um, we also noted that block A1, um, public open space, um, and block G1, the podium level amenity space, also don't meet the BREE criteria. Um, and whilst we note that um, maybe that situation is slightly different in the height of summer, um, if we are trying to create places that are usable for as much of the year as possible and attractive places for people to live and recreate and enjoy their open space, then we are concerned about um, it not meeting the breed criteria in the core open space areas. I don't know if you have any comments or feedback on that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I suppose um, while you, you you picked out these um, six or so areas which don't meet the BRE target, um, the the overarching situation is that you know out of the fifty three external amenity spaces. 48 will exceed the, the BRE recommendations. So I suppose the first point from my perspective is that um, you know the vast majority of external amenity spaces will um, meet and exceed the BRE target. Um, in, in relation to those that don't, I think a balance has to be struck really between the sort of design ideology of courtyards and, and the limiting factors that they have in relation to um to to, to overshadowing or, or, or sunlight on the ground and um it yes it on the 21st of march uh, some of them um particularly a5 and block a1 that uh, doesn't fare very well but um the, the areas that we've assessed are the whole areas in the courtyard and one of the ways of um mitigating these common issues of you know of of of, of sunlight penetration in, in 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 urban schemes is is the layout of that space so that if for example um there are areas for um you know specific uses like children's play areas or sitting out areas again at detailed design stage those areas can be designed so that um the areas which it gets to get the sunlight of the, uh, the those amenities are put there so it's really um again a balance and thinking about how to mitigate that at detailed design uh, and, and also the point about the parameters and the, and how changes to the shape or ultimately the height of blocks can also change the sunlight penetration characteristics so i think that um it will it, it it it's a it's a starting point i suppose at this in this time and you know that can be looked at more closely um again at detailed design stage and um you know the overarching point really of of um of the vast majority meeting the bre guide target um i appreciate what you say about using the spaces um for as much of the year as possible but again when we do look at the midsummer um solstice all, all of the areas all 53 of them will quite comfortably outstrip the bre target and, and most of them 
have a hundred percent sun uh, are a hundred percent sunlit, and a few are down in the seventies and eighties percent. So it, it, again, it's 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 a it's a balance between you know having um, having the uh, the, the the design ethos of the scheme and density versus um, the the outcome on this on these particular points. But again, I, I go back to the BRE guide that you know they're the ones who set this target and they are very clear in in their introduction that these numeric targets are only guidelines and that they're not instruments of planning policy and uh, to development proposals shouldn't be. Um, you know, sh sh shouldn't be set aside because of a relatively small number of um, of results that don't accord with those those aspirational targets in the BRE guide. I just come back and on that really, and I guess when I looked at the schedule of sites and saw, as you say, the quantity that do comply with the BRE guidance. It, creates a, an impression that perhaps things aren't so bad but actually when you look at those plots which are um, not meeting the Brie guidance they're actually the core um, core private communal areas at ground floor level for residents of the scheme um, and it's just quite concerning and disappointing I'm, I'm not sure I share the same hope that they can be designed in a way to address that because the maximum parameters with the heights that will be permitted if, if permission is granted. I can't envisage those being lowered um, in terms of designing the space so that the areas which do receive the sunlight um, could be prioritized. But when you're dealing with 9% of the space meeting the breed criteria, then it's, it's quite small areas. Um, and the other challenge is the rooftop amenity space um, whilst in mathematical terms, provides another contribution to private amenity space. Um, I, I know that we have concerns about the usability of that space given um, potential wind impacts and conflicts with rooftop plant, photovoltaics, other, other potential uses. So um, the ground floor private amenity spaces are, are really important for the scheme to deliver a decent place for people to live and enjoy the environment they live in. Um, but thank you. I, I don't have anything okay. more to add. Okay, I'll just um, see if um, the applicants team want to ask any questions or clarify any points. No, I, I've, I've followed that very closely. It is a, uh, a technical issue, um, and uh, I think the introduction uh, that was given there uh, was... Was, was very clear in my mind that these are guide these are guidelines. They are not um, uh, uh, mandatory pass uh, fail. It is uh, a, a tool uh, to aid an assessment. Um, we have uh, you know been through in, in detail the um, the kind of graded colour um, figures, and uh, I think. Um, I noted down that 90% uh, you know, of all, all the facades are uh, likely to uh, meet the uh, VSC uh, requirements um, through the application of um, detailed design uh, uh, works where necessary. And in, in relation to the um, uh, amenity space areas, um, you know, we've got 53 uh, accounted up uh, on here. I fully accept that, that, that um, five of them uh, miss the targets, uh, 48 exceed. Uh, and it is um, you know, identifiable that uh, I think of the five that uh, miss the targets, uh, they are uh, generally the uh, ground floor spaces, uh, but there are uh, some ground floor areas uh, which are absolutely fine. Uh, block uh, C2 is one of the largest ground floor areas. Uh, and that uh, meets the, the guidance. And that is a uh, you know, March point. And when you move into uh, the summer, uh, the, the solstice, everything meets the guidance. Um, 
we should, in, in my view, also not lose sight of the range of spaces that are, are available. These are the spaces which are in school to the uh, residential uh, uh, components of the scheme, but the entire development includes other uh, amenity areas which are um, a part of the, the, the public uh, spaces that, that are created and they're, they're not part of this assessment and that they're available year round uh, for the amenity of the, uh, the residents of the area as well. So I think there is a, a lot more in terms of amenity uh, and open space than is actually considered in here. Okay, I, think. I think if I could just add to John's um, point there, I think the other the other thing to mention is although these are kind of key key communal spaces for the residential blocks, there is also a significant amount of, of um, communal amenity space on the rooftops. So uh, I think of of around sort of twelve and a half thousand square meters of, of communal space. Uh, it's around nine thousand on the roof. So a, a significant amount is is on the roof spaces as well. And I think that to build on John's point of having that kind of variation of spaces, um, those will be particularly sunny areas. Um, and having that kind of uh, variation, I suppose, between, between sunnier, sunnier spots on roof terraces and shadier spots in courtyards is not necessarily a, a bad thing. They might be a bit breezy as well. Yeah, they have. I mean, we'll come on to wind, and I know that's, <laughs> that's been raised, and that the roof terraces have been but have been considered in the, the wind assessments. Th throughout throughout the discussions uh, today and yesterday, um, the the issue of, uh, of balance is uh, at, the, at the fore of my mind. Uh, uh, we have not uh, hidden behind any uh, kind of smoke and mirrors. There's a, there is a clearly reference in here to uh, where problems exist. Uh, it is all part of a, uh, a wider balance in relation to a full range of factors, both in relation to uh, sunlight and daylight and uh, all the other planning issues that come into consideration. So. Okay. Okay, well, th thank you, Mr McKenna. That's helpful. If, maybe if you just hold on, because um, well, th there's, a, there's a few more amenity related issues that I'd like to work through before I go to, to any, any questions from, from the public. Um, I think the, the next one, uh, it's not on the list though, but we need to talk about privacy, um, overlooking issues. And I think this does link to the, uh, the, the plots, the distances that we've, we've talked about. Um, and. Um, I mean, I've had a walk around the Horizon development and uh, I've seen uh, and some comments were made earlier in the week about balconies facing balconies and proximities of uh, win windows. Um, I've, I've seen also in the design codes that there is, uh, there is some commentary on this in terms of avoiding where you've got blocks uh, facing each other, avoiding windows facing directly so, so they would be, be offset but perhaps if the the applicants can, team could just talk me through uh and well try and comfort me that um where you get those tighter proximities eight meters ten meters or whatever that uh, that is workable in amenity terms yeah i mean i think one thing to point out we we um as you rightly say, the, the codes provide some some means of, of offsetting balconies on the tighter spaces. They are uh, not facing one another, so there wouldn't be direct overlooking. Um, there's restrictions placed on where you can have projecting balconies and where they need to be inset. Um, in terms of those tighter spaces, I think it's it's worth pointing out that those are, and we, we touched on this yesterday, I think when we were talking about that eight meter wide route, that when you look at the, um, the illustrative floor plans, those areas where you have those kind of eight meter pinches tend to be very, very short areas at the, um, the entrances to those courtyards. Um, and the, the units in those locations would generally have another aspect. Um, so they would, for example, be looking to, if you take, uh, say, block C1, um, the, the units at either end of, of that facing out onto the eight-metre 
route um, would also have a, a northerly and a southerly aspect as well. Um, so I think there are there are design options um, which are, are set out within the codes that that can can avoid um, overlooking on those units. Okay, but if you look at that gap between, say, I don't know, D1 and E1, you've got quite a length there, and uh, on the, the corner blocks, so yeah, absolutely, you could uh, have dual aspect there, but in the middle, aren't you going to end up with single aspect units facing each other? Yeah, there are in that example. So those those are slightly wider routes. I think those are twelve meter, twelve meter wide. Um, if I am correct, or just yeah, ten to ten to twelve meters wide. Um, and again, the codes kind of set some some requirements in terms of offsetting balconies and limiting projecting balconies, uh, so that you you would never have a, a projecting balcony facing another another balcony, and, and there would be limited overlooking likewise for windows in terms of ensuring that those are, are offset from one another so there's no no direct overlooking we ask the planning authority is this this a matter that um, you've looked at um, I think it's it is difficult until we we know the exact makeup of of rooms and elevations and balconies and so forth but um, I think in town generally there's there's an expectation that standards for um, overlooking privacy living arrangements are a bit more relaxed than other parts of the island because of the you know the close-knit um, arrangements for development um, and I guess that um, Whereas we talked about the impacts on horizon previously, those are built and uh, in, the, in the main and occupied. So those residents would have an expectation of, of a level of amenity and, pri uh, and privacy. Whereas with a new, a new development being built, people would, would be buying into something that they, they knew was, was new and they knew was going to be there. And as such, they would have a great expectation that there wouldn't be that level of issue to them. Um, but I guess it's until we know the, the exact makeup of the scheme, it's difficult to okay, comment so precisely. I think you share Mr Nicholson's point. Of it. It's, it's contextual, that, that yeah. assessment. In the, in the TAS, um, there, there is some analysis of street widths in, in relation to why the kind of 8, 10, 12 was picked. And it's kind of one of these moments when like some planning tools that you end up carrying around you think actually might be useful. Uh, it's difficult to visualise what, what um, you know, a space of, of between 10 and 12 metres is, but that's, that's Gloucester Street. That, that is a, not a tight space. Um, that, that's a 12 metre uh, space there. You will not be passing a cup of sugar to your neighbour across the balcony or hanging your washing out between two uh, you know, rows, as in Rome or, or Naples, the the, um, the the scale of these spaces is, in in my view, uh, not mean. And I share the view uh, of, of Mr. Jones. It it is not uncommon across many streets in town, whether they are large scale developments or some of the uh, grain around nor the northern parts of town, where uh, smaller buildings are set very much uh, in, in, a, in a closer context. Okay, let me just um, explore one final issue on amenity before we move on to wind, which has got some amenity implications. And, and, and that is um, particularly around the blocks that are close to the the main sort of coastal interfaces and uh, Le Jardin area. Um, there's a lot of activity that goes on there currently, and I, I was down there wandering around on Sunday morning, and there was a you know, just typical charity event, it was Race for Life, and boy, was it pounding out. I mean, I, I walked... 
I was down at First Tower and I could still hear the bass beat thumping away. And uh, I'm just conscious that um, there is that interface there between wanting to use a public space for all of those good community reasons and activities and the fact that you're going to have um, expensive residential properties right on the doorstep and whether there's any thought being given to that that tension about how that is is managed I'm, I'm familiar with it because I'm, I'm familiar with with Cardiff and when Cardiff docks uh, uh, transformed itself. It was quite interesting because uh, everyone uh, spoke very well of it and then when it all sort of settled in and activities started happening, those that had moved in and spent a uh, small fortune on their luxury apartments took exception to big wheels appearing and people on zip wires and uh, constant music events. Um, so... Yeah, I think, if I, if I may... Um, as uh, the stewards and uh, owners of these um, public areas of open space, um, we schedule a range of events um, to take place um, on the Weybridge, on Marina Gardens, on Le Jana de la Mer. Um, these events typically take place um, during during the daytime, there are very few events that, that run into the evening, and where they do run into the evening, there is a, a, a fairly um, reasonable cut-off time um, in terms of uh, noise. The major events also are required to go through um, the bailiff's panel, um, so right. there is a, a, an oversight and approval um, required for major events um, by the by the by the island's bailiff, um, and so you know there there is a a degree of control um, around the um, arrangements of those events, both from a, uh, a a health and safety perspective as well as a, a you know, potential disturbance, noise, policing um, requirement. Um, and as I say to date, um, you know, we've obviously have um, already significant numbers of residents on the waterfront um, at Castle Quay, at Harbour Reach, um, and at Victoria and Albert Pier housing. Um, and those residents, you know, are immediately adjacent to areas of, of public realm that, that do from time to time um, host events, whether it be the, the boat show or whether it be the Super League triathlon that attract literally thousands of people um, down to those areas. Um, and, and I, I would suggest that the vast majority of residents will, will be yeah, actively enjoying the, 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 the spectator opportunity that their, that their properties um, afford them. I understand. Good answers. One okay. of the key um, documents we keep referring to is the uh, South West and Helia Framework and uh, General Policy 3, Community Expectation, which is advocated here, is to enjoy a vibrant and colourful district with community facilities, shops, cafes and restaurants, which remain lively during the evenings and at weekends all year round. So if you want year-round peace and quiet, this might not be the location for you. Yeah, it's... Um... Okay, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, okay, well, I've got a few more issues. We're running out of time on the day, but uh, let me uh, just open it for. So, we, we've run through a range of amenity issues in terms of impacts on uh, existing residents and the amenity expectations for future residents. And I was picking up an awful lot around, well, it's all down to the detailed design um, uh, on, on those latter points. But I'll, I'll open it up to, to a few questions now, and then we'll, we'll close off with uh, some short sessions on wind uh, and amenity space provision. But that's also going to be covered uh, tomorrow anyway. So any questions? Mr Viber. Thank you, sir. I, I don't like to correct uh, 
Lee on the matter of events taking place on the waterfront. Um, people who live on the waterfront are in fact quite sensitive about noise. Um, only a couple of years ago, the residents in the area complained about the slapping of the halyards on the masts in the harbour, not just once, but a continued complaint about it. And certainly the bailiff uh, has a say in what should take place, but he's unlikely to refuse a charity event or any event on the ground that it might uh, cause a bit of noise for the residents there. So noise could be a real, very real problem, sir in that particular area. You've experienced a number of people already. We're talking about a place where there could be 1,500 people at one time all coming out to, en to enjoy themselves. So I don't think we should take noise uh, as easily as has as been suggested. Secondly, so I'd like to reiterate the point I made about the amenity that is missing in on the waterfront in a very big way, and that's open space. Open space is a very important amenity, and anywhere you travel in the world, when you go to cities that are well civilised and operate well, there are always lots of open spaces and parks. And we've experienced it recently, in, and I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to visit it, sir, um, on the other side of St Helia, uh, we now have a new park that's been there no more than about five years that's totally revolutionised that whole residential area. It's called the Millennium Park and in fact, to tell a quick story, we only got it by accident because a member of the states voted for it because his ring binder got in the way of pressing the no button and he pressed the yes button and we now have a most beautiful park there. And the reason I'm raising it is that I believe that's what the people of Jersey are expecting there would have been on the waterfront. And it's possible to achieve it, providing you don't put as many places there on, on the waterfront. And I can't stress more to you than the need for space and that's the thing that's missing. The second thing that's missing, and I've raised it once before with you, uh, is there's no playground. There's absolutely no place anywhere for children to play. I raise it because I was brought up on a housing estate at Clota Parody at Almora. And it was built in 1938. And it was a circular estate, still there, uh, still owned by Andium. But they took the playground that was in the middle, which contained a swing, a, a roundabout, and a slide. And that's where I spent my childhood. And that's exactly the kind of thing that's needed. We've got it at the Millennium Park, not swings and roundabouts, but all kinds of things for children to play. And you go there any afternoon and you'll see mothers with small children by the hundreds in that park. And the waterfront is, in, in, is a perfect place for it. And it can be achieved, but it can't be achieved, sir, if you put that number of flats on the place. Thank you. Are we? Do you want us to come back on that point now, or are we taking more questions? You can do. Um, so I think it's it's just worth pointing out that there are significant amounts of open space on the site. I think of, of the gross site area, I think it's fifty six percent open space. Um, that does include significant amounts of, of play space that are coded for. I know we're going to come on to that tomorrow, so I don't yes. want to go into it in too much detail now, but within the codes there are play spaces provided within um, Chardin de la Mer, uh, including the extension of that, um, significant extension of that, and within Marina Gardens and various courtyards, but we'll deal with that in detail Let, tomorrow. Let's pick that up tomorrow. Um, I, I was wondering whether actually the last item on the list here, amenity space provision, whether that might sit better tomorrow when we're talking about open spaces. We are kind of drifting on a bit. That's fine with us, Because yeah. um, I, I, I don't want to rush that because I want to... I want to understand the standards that are, are applied and the, uh, how the population figure is worked out and uh, whether it meets it. So we'll, we'll take that last item, amenity space provision, and we'll slot it in 
um, session eight to tomorrow. I think if we put it uh, before, after the swimming pool cinema, uh, and then before provision of open space. Um, which just leaves us with wind to discuss. Yes, sir. You can, yes. You can, yeah. Um, we, Jersey, my experience has been environmental health. We have to rely on the environmental health law in Jersey. Um, we have a statutory nuisance law, but it's very complicated, and if you wanted to go into that, you'd need to get evidence from the public, from the environmental health team. It isn't, we don't have the full statutory structure to deal with that in Jersey. We, we, but there we are, that's, I'm afraid. So you'd need to get extra evidence. Yeah, thank you. We, we do have environmental health on Friday morning, we dealing do. with noise. Ms. So McCarthy, you okay? Um, I did ask at the last session, I didn't want to ask another question, so I just tag it in the front. But when you made a very important point, is within the envelope shown, can they fit everything in? But this is also future proofed. And there's some very important uh, issues, such as fire escape, uh, obviously, after the, uh, the tragedy in, um, in Notting Hill. And what they're doing now is they're planning to reduce the number of floors you can have for a single, uh, single staircase to 11 metres. So that would affect, that means they'd need to put in additional cores. The other aspect is to do with floor, floor, to, floor to ceiling height. Obviously, if you're overheating with a lot of glazing, you need taller floor to ceiling height to avoid putting in air conditioning. So that it isn't just a simple... So I just think you're fitting, it's fit, fit for purpose that's also low energy, mm -hmm. fit for purpose. Um, I want to cover this. There's two aspects. One is on um, the environmental impact assessment. There is uh, construction and then there is in use. However, this is complicated because it's, we're, we're living in it as we're building it. So I <laughs> don't know how you deal with that one, but construction is going to be covered later. But if we looked at the end case, you can, so we're aware, there are computer software out there that if you put all the codes in, it will actually produce a design. It will produce a design for you. And what you want, whatever you want. You, want, uh, you could change the number of bedrooms you want, everything. But nobody wants to live in it. That's terribly important. So I don't, when they said this is landscape driven, I think it's maybe code driven, um, but, what an EIA is about is to improve the design. It isn't there as a stick, it's there to aid. Uh, but in the UK, in, a, in London, any development, more than 10 units, not 1,000 units, 10 units, they also provide a health impact, uh, uh, environmental, uh, a health impact assessment. Why? Because it's to demonstrate why and how will this development improve people's health and well-being if they moved from the countryside to here, if they move from the St. Helier to here. How would it improve their health? And that is complex, but there is a process. We don't have to, in Jersey, provide one. But again, I refer back to this, this, this uh, developer is stating to its shareholders, which is us, that they're working to the highest international uh, environmental social governance, and therefore one would expect to have been covered. The other aspect is um, this developer, we've got to be very aware that they're not only the developer of this site, they're, they're also, we also, the islanders, own the, all uh, the site around, the, around this site. We own it. So they're representing both this development and the neighboring sites. And therefore, there has to be a degree of independence between an assessment that covers how it's going to affect neighbours, which the developer is also has an interest in. Um, the, the other aspect is I see, and I've had a lot of experience worldwide on developments like this, uh, in 45 years, um, I see this is simply a bulk diagram creating a problem to solve. That's money. You solve it with spending money. 
not affordable homes. You spend it on air conditioning. You spend it on uh, certain uh, to deal with the noise and all these things, the wind and it's cash. But what you're not spending the money on is people. It's solving a problem. So now, when I look at the solving problem, I have to give Jersey its credit. I was very lucky to work on Daltrey School. We were very uh, supported by the government, and with their uh, £50,000 uh, energy grant, we developed software so we could develop, understand the difference between width, size of windows and heat loss and heat gain, um, also the effects of wind. And that software is now used around the world. I'm also experienced in understanding what's it like living in a hostile, windy environment, such as Brighton development involved in, such as uh, 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 Greenwich Millennium Village. But also I'm very aware and understand about air pollution. I've worked on uh, the, some of the worst air pollution areas, such as Elephant Castle. And how important it is that when you're dealing with air pollution, you also deal with wind simultaneously. And this goes back to the environmental impact assessment and the executive summary. It isn't about here are the chapters, it's about how the chapters interact with each other. And of course, wind dispersion of air pollution, of a, the, you know, one of the busiest roads, which is also, um, I have to put it in, in, in context, it is the tunnel itself, if we just start with the tunnel, we're not allowed to increase the air pollution of that tunnel because it already exceeds the World Health Organization, which is, a, which is used by pedestrians as well as obviously cyclists and everybody else. And this development no doubt increased the air pollution because it would generate more traffic. But what I'm concerned about, about this development, is at the moment the wind just flies over the site. What's very simple about wind, it comes along, it travels over the, over the water, it travels across the beach, and then it will disperse the air pollution as it builds up and builds up in that gas chamber called the underpass. Now, if you then build a wall of development as described by the Jersey Architectural Commission, you then call, create what they call is an air pollution canyon. And that has been assessed and planned. This hasn't been assessed on this project. So you generate an air pollution canyon, and that does affect people both on the new development but as importantly, the other side of the road. Now, whether you live working in an office or, or residential, it doesn't make any difference. But what does make it also a difference, if it's a public space where you're telling people to go there, you're also telling birds and wildlife to encourage them to go there to be affected by that pollution. So that hasn't been considered at all. But why should it be? Because, again, I repeat, the scoping document was submitted. It wasn't, uh, there was no comments received. And as far as consultees, there was, the consultees weren't consulted. And certainly the neighbours to the site, which is basically we, we islanders are the landowners of all the land around the site, as well as the, the occupiers of those buildings. The, so now I'm going to talk about, I've hopefully, I'm just touched on a couple of issues outside the site, which worries me extremely. The next thing I'm going to do is talk about inside the site. Now, I value, and I value the work you've done. Um, our problem is we've got a, a master plan, so we've got a, whatever they want to call it, a block diagram with, no, uh, with all reserved matters. So we don't actually know where the swimming pool's going. It's not where it's shown doesn't mean it's going to go there. It could be anywhere else. When we look at solar access, it depends on what people are doing. If it's a car park, of course you're not bothered, or bin area, but you're damned interest if it's a swimming pool. You're damn interested if it's a children's playground. And that's not in the drawings. That's why the Jersey Architecture Commission stressed the importance that you need to have a detailed plan, which shows the landscape has to be a detailed site, showing exactly where everything is, so you can actually look at it. So suggesting that for, us, for the outside space, that it, from, the tw from the 21st of September, you may have two hours of sunlight. Thereafter that, you get less and less and less until the 21st of March. So during that time, there'll be none. How much time, I don't know. But that is important. That means no sunlight for, for most of the year. So now, the Jersey Architecture Commission 
stressed um, in their statement. This is, this is their last Jersey Architectural Review be before the planning application went in, which is May. They weren't invited back, so I do stress it's for the developer to invite the Jersey Architecture Commission, not the other way around. And we paid for this, and they state um, community, engagement with the community is critical. As previously noted, true engagement involves explaining to the public the options. That's right, explaining to the public the options. Now, the Options is saying here's a building massing and everybody has got daylight, everybody has got fresh air, everybody's got fantastic views, everybody um, has solar gain in the winter, everybody's got nighttime cool breezes from the sea, everybody can grow crops, everybody um, can sleep at night for the tranquility, everybody um, does, uh, has privacy. And here's the scheme. And we still can deliver 1,000 homes. And here's another scheme where you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't have this, and you can't have this. So then the public can actually have a meaningful discussion. So the next thing is we move into the interior of the building. How much longer are you going to be, Mr. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm Good. just wrapping up. Then we move into the interior of the building. I mean, this is a major, huge subject we're covering. And, at the end of a rather tiring day, is we depend upon the environmental impact assessment to look at the internal space. So I did stress that what we're looking at is not only that when you live in these places, that it's a lovely, you know, lovely place to live in, and that it's a nice home, and it improves your productivity at work, and it increases your wealth, and so you can buy a bigger house after, or buy a house in the country, whatever. The environmental scoping I've talked about, the environmental executive summary that is specifically prepared for public consultation. Now, so it's for us to be able to read that and say, okay, they're gonna build these homes for us. What's the daylight going to be like inside those homes? No information. What's the solar access gonna be like inside these homes? No information. What's the internal noise going to be like inside these homes and on the balcony? Can I use it? No information. What is, is the air pollution going to be like inside my home that comes off the road? What's the air pollution going to be like on my balcony where I'm growing my tomatoes? No information. So I follow through and I will wrap up on a very important statement made by the Jersey Architectural Commission. The most important thing is there are fantastic examples of amazing projects in St. Helena, old and new. I've seen some very good examples. It can be done here. And one of the most amazing projects, new, is the very first project this site did. And that was based on the the By Islanders, For Islanders Development Framework 2000. And it's there, it's over there. And it's called the Victoria Place and Albert Place. And I spoke to people here that for first time buyers, it those homes are the most popular in the island. There's a queue banging on the door wanting that. So we've got very good examples of what we can deliver. Now, what the, uh, how the, uh, this is the, review done on the 31st of March this year. This is after the planning uh, uh, application for public consultation had ended. So the public can have this, obviously, to comment on. But it says, you know, the question at the heart of all design reviews is that uh, they, ins they inspire, they capture the character and the atmosphere of St. Helia. Inspire, capture, the character, the atmosphere of St. Helia. And if you close your eyes, you know what those spaces are, you know those places, you know those homes. And then it went on to say, the parameter plans 
presented sadly do not deliver. And I could not agree more. This proposal does not deliver. Why doesn't it deliver? Is it, is it the planning's useless? Yeah, the island plan's useless? Is the framework useless? Is it the developer's useless? Something's useless. Because they can deliver. Because I can tell you now, on 11 acre site, 11 hectare site, the islanders can have the highest, the best environment to live in or play in. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Right, I want to finish off on the subject of wind. I think you've got a witness on this. Uh, Is he? Delta wouldn't mind yeah. uh, transferring. Thank you very much, Ian. We'll thank you. To our, our uh, other witness. It's, um, it's Mr. Symes, is it? Correct. Here's Joe. Afternoon, Mr. Symes. Can you hear us loud and clear? <coughs> I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. OK. Um, well, we're, we're obviously running late. We're running over, over, over time. Uh, I think we can be, well, hopefully fairly concise on this. I've read your proof of evidence. I read the chapter in the environmental assessment and the various drawings that go with that. And I should say, I am fairly familiar with this issue because uh, I have seen similar assessments on other uh, developments in Jersey. So uh, I, I understand the modelling and I understand what uh, you've produced. And cutting to your conclusions, uh, it seems to be that, uh, uh, well, uh, it's no secret, this is a windy site, a windy location, and you've modelled uh, the likely wind effects. And there are a couple of locations uh, where they get up to the, the, the sort of levels which would give some cause for concern and would require some mitigation. Is that a fair summary? Uh, yes, that's correct. So just sort of for the minutes, we have undertaken a, a physical wind hard, uh, assessment to look at the wind conditions in and around the site. Um, and that has been judged against the loss and comfort criteria, which is the kind of, and the loss and safety criteria, which are the kind of standard criteria within the UK for assessing wind microclimate. We looked at sort of, we looked at three scenarios. We looked at the existing site to give us a baseline, the proposed site with the existing surrounds, and then the proposed site, the proposed development, sorry, with the um, other future developments. And as the kind of results sh kind of show, and as what would not be of any surprise to anyone, when you look at the existing conditions, it is a somewhat windy site. It's a coastal location. It's exposed to winds coming off the coast. So it is, a, it is by its nature a windy site. The introduction of the proposed development does create a number, a few areas which are windier than desired and a few areas which exceed the safety, uh, the strong wind safety criteria. We then undertook a further test into the, to develop uh, recommendations for mitigation measures that will be incorporated into the codes um, to try to address those. And that included uh, in testing with the um, uh, proposed landscaping with the trees as per the heights in, at planting as well as other more physical uh, hard measures such as canopies, undercuts, uh, screening, and um, uh, solid balustrades around the rooftop amenity spaces. And following that testing, we were able to develop a set of measures that has been divided in the codes. Uh, but there are still a, a small number of locations which would require further work at the reserve matter stage. Uh, but the majority, with, with the kind of those mitigation measures in place, the majority of conditions would be considered acceptable for the, uh, the um, intended use. I would particularly note that with the introduction of the balustrades around or habits around the rooftop community, all of the rooftop community space achieved at a minimum what we call standing conditions, which is what we normally consider acceptable for uh, general use community. And the majority of the rooftop community space actually achieves. Um, sitting conditions, which is the calmest conditions. Um, we did not test any of the, any of the soft or other landscaping on those rooftop community spaces. So we do anticipate once that is start, that is included, wind conditions on the rooftop community spaces would actually get calmer. So we identified no particular concerns in relation to the rooftop community space. The only uh, couple of outlier, a couple of remaining potential issues are at ground level and, and as noted, that will be in 
in, in our EF chapter and in my proof of evidence that will be assessed further as part of the reserved matters. Um, I would just turn to the planning authority. I can't remember if uh, you made submissions yeah. on you did. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just um, good afternoon, Mr. Simons. It's Wendy Johnston from the planning authority. Um, I'll also just preface this by saying I'm absolutely not a wind expert. So um, apologies now if any of these questions might seem daft. <laughs> um, so I note from the environmental Im impact statement that in order to provide mitigation for the wind impacts, there are design techniques that can be used. And there's also a reliance on planting and landscaping um, to provide mitigation. Um, and in the visuals we see in the design codes, it looks like quite a lot of mature planting um, evergreen species in the waterfront area. Um, one point we were seeking clarity on this morning, which we didn't get, was how long will it take for that landscaping to establish um, to the extent that it will provide the wind mitigation necessary to, to mitigate these impacts? So the modeling we did was based on the height of the trees at the time of planting. So the trees will be planted uh, as either semi-mature as semi -mature and then mature to their full height. But we modeled them at the, the height at which they will be uh, planted. So we have allowed for that fact that they are not going to be there at their full maturity to ensure that they are still being effective from day one in effect. But looking at some of the planting, it looks like it's quite high mature planting. And I guess from experience, we know that when you plant in a harsh coastal environment, you generally plant young species so that they can acclimatize and develop and grow to withstand the harsh conditions. Um, so you're saying that what young species that are planted will provide the wind mitigation that's required in along the kind of St. Oban's Bay coastline. So as I said, as I said the, 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 when we modeled the planting, we modeled it as per, you know, as it was the heights and sizes it, at the time of planting. Now I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a plant expert. Um, so I, I can't comment, let it come up oh. on, on sort of how, how well certain species will do in a windy environment, but I said we have taken into, you know, our assessment to take into account the fact that these would at the time of planting not be fully mature uh, uh, species or, or trees or, or planting. If I could um, come in on, on this, on I think the, um, the, the modelled sizes are as per the, the planted sizes that are set out on page 94 of the design codes. Um, so there's planted size, I think it's large tree sizes, 8 to 10 metres medium trees five to seven and small trees two to four at planting. Um, so those are the, the tree heights that, that are shown um, in the modeling. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of the species, I, I think we, we spoke about this earlier a bit that we've, we have based the, the selection on species that we know do well in windy conditions and, and develop, um, uh, will develop full canopies um, based, on, based on JDC's experience in other similar spaces. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, I did have further comments as well. Sorry. I had further comments as well, if, that, if that's Karen. okay, yeah. So sorry, just in terms of the eight to 10 meter high trees, so they will be planted at eight to 10 meter high trees, or they will be planted as young trees and grow to that height? Yeah, they'll be planted as, as eight to 10 meter high trees. Okay, and we're comfortable that they will survive in the harsh conditions when planted? Yeah, I think based on our, based on our species selection, we are comfortable that they will, they will be uh, but they will survive. Okay. Um, the EIS identifies that if you don't have mitigation in place, then there'd be 26 locations with occurrences of strong winds with the potential to be a safety concern to more vulnerable pedestrians and cyclists. Additionally, there'd be a further three locations with occurrences of strong winds with the potential to be a safety concern for all pedestrians. Um, whilst the EIS indicates that with mitigation, the number of locations which present concern is reduced, um, it's unclear to what extent that mitigation is based on landscaping. Do, are you able to confirm if that, in order to provide the mitigation benefits to make it 
a usable space, um, how much of that is dependent on landscaping? So we, our, our mitigation strategy that we develop it, it is a combination of hard, hard measures. So there's quite extensive use of canopies and, and screen supplemented then in, in some areas with, with landscaping. Um, I guess the, our point would be that we just have concern about a reliance on landscaping to provide the wind mitigation. Um, and and if, if it is landscaping that's required and it doesn't, it doesn't work in the way planned, then that's quite in 26 locations with um, occurrences of strong winds that have potential to be a safety concern is actually quite a high number. So that would just be a point we noted. Um, just continuing on, sorry, I don't want to labour any points, but um, I noted from your proof of evidence that you said, um, you mentioned that the wind climate in Jer Jersey is generally quite windy when compared to mainland areas in the UK, um, such as London. Um, that the site's directly exposed to westerly winds. So you carried out the wind impact assessment based on the Lawson comfort criteria, um, which has a comfort level for outdoor seating of 0 to 4 metres per second, um, where one can sit comfortably and read for longer periods. However, I do know that the City of London wind microclimate guidelines, which were produced far more recently, which I think your team were involved in authoring, introduce a lower speed for, for that sort of environment, a lower speed of 2.5 meters per second. Um, and that's referred to as the frequent sitting category. Um, and that was actually developed based on City of London's desire to create more active public spaces with amenable cafes, restaurants, sitting areas in the future. And just co also continuing on that thread, the London's wind microclimate guidelines also introduce um, an uncomfortable category of eight meters per second and above, which the guideline states based on experience that the Lawson business walking conditions often led to complaints in the city of London. So they basically renamed the business walking conditions category to being uncomfortable. Um, and that that category is only suitable for areas that are not expected to receive regular public footfall, like service areas, back of house. So what we have is the wind impact analysis for the waterfront development categorizes eight meters per second and above as actually being suitable for business walking, and it's 10 meters per second and above as being uncomfortable. So basically what that means is that you have, if you look at the image in Appendix 17.1, which gives the various colored dots for areas where you're gonna have wind impacts of eight meters per second and above and 10 meters per second and above. You've got the pink and red dots and you actually get quite a lot more areas which could quite easily be classed as uncomfortable. Um, I just wondered on the basis of of the updated guidance, which I appreciate is, is developed for the City of London, but you acknowledge is not as windy. I wondered if you'd considered using those more stringent standards here when carrying out the wind impact assessment. Yes, yeah, so as you know, the City of London wind and guidelines are developed, were developed specifically for the use in, in the, within the City of London they take into account the specific wind climate and sort of urban context of the city of London. Uh, they are not intended to be used outside of the city of London. Now, other authorities have, have developed their own guidelines, but we would probably advise caution about trying to apply those city of London guidelines wider, in particular, the frequent sitting guidelines do a suit are based, are de were developed based on a sort of more heavy urban environment a non-coastal environment and a, a, gen, a, a sort of climate which is generally less windy than in uh, Jersey. With regards to the walking and um, uncomfortable, you are correct that the the um, the, the uh, city of London guidelines explicitly refer, refer to the, what what is in the standard laws and criteria as walking as uncomfortable. But it has been sort of standard practice within the industry generally to try to avoid what the business walking. Anyway, we have always taken the view that, you know, for, 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 your, for most developments, uh, particularly thoroughfares, we would try to target a, 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 what we call strolling as a kind of maximum. We, 
we have historically taken the view that the business walking for most uses is is too windy. The City of London has just taken that sort of st industry standard guidelines and codified it into their particular guidelines in sort of black and white. But that is kind of in line with what is the industry standard approach anyway. Okay, just a, cu a couple of final points. Um, and I think it would be useful to actually go to the diagrams. Um, this is in Appendix 17.1. And there's an Appendix C to Appendix 17.1, which um, runs through some of the interventions in terms of mitigation measures. So we've, there's figure 13, um, which provides a markup of mitigation measures developed through iterative testing. Um, and this particular figure shows canopies um, and the, the depth of those canopies. I just want to check, had they been included in the parameter plans in terms of the maximum extent of development, or are they on top of the, um, in excess of the development plots that we see on the parameter plans? Because some of them are um, three meters deep. Um, particular, I guess particularly, I was just looking at block D2 on there, which projects out towards Rue de la Toe, and just wanted to check if that was within the parameter. That'll be a sec, sorry. I'm yeah, no worries. In terms of our modeling, the, we, obviously the model, the physical model we built was based on the match parameter plan. And then the mitigation measures were on top of that. My understanding is that the design, and this is obviously the uh, other members of the team would probably to clarify, the design code has been updated to include these now as part of the code, with the intention that they would, the plans would, you know, these would be incorporated into those plans where appropriate. Um, and I, I'm sure they probably are in the codes, but the the issue is the, in terms of the. Built what well, the maximum horizontal envelopes of development, particularly on Rue de la Toe, are really quite tight in terms of coming up to the road edge. And if there's a further three meter canopy that projects be or beyond the building footprint, I, I'm not even sure how these canopies work, but it's just to understand if there's enough space for that. Uh, my understanding is that the, the the maximum extents would need to include any wind mitigation measures. There is, as we've spoken about before, there's some flexibility in the way the, the codes are written in terms of how those measures are developed in detail. We know that um, that through detailed design there may be there may be other alternatives to to achieve the same effect, but that is written into the codes as a requirement that it must achieve um, the equal effect. Uh, via detailed design. Um, and that would need to take place within the within the parameter extents, is my understanding. Okay. Okay. Um, then the next page, I'm oh, sorry, there's two more points. Oh, I know it's late. The next um, page, figure 14, um, shows the inclusion of quite substantial screens um, to mitigate impacts. Um, so, for example, um, we have some three meter tall screens. Some of them are elevated, some of them at ground level. There's a six meter tall screen between block B1 and the Radisson. Um, is, does the design codes, or is there anywhere which gives an indication what those screens look like? Um, I, I can't quite visualize them, particularly when they're at ground level. Um, so it's just maybe understanding. I don't, I don't think there's any kind of detail given for what that what that design would look like. I think it's a similar situation to the canopies that quite often we find through through detailed design measures. There's there's other means to to achieve the same effect, and I think it's something that would need to be worked into the detailed design of the plots in this case. In term, okay. So if say the screens were unattractive or something that were not supported, what would be the alternatives to screens in those locations? 
talk about screens, we are talking about a, a element of a sort of a policy and we, we use screens as a sort of analog, uh, but that could be, that can be in the form of any sort of element of a similar sort of mass, sort of size, dimensions, and that level of policy. I've seen, you know, I have seen this done with artwork um, and other sort of elements so that it, it's, it's effectively something that provides the same impact as that screen. The screen is just a, it's a technical analog basically of, of the final measure and, and Finally, um, sorry, going the wrong way. Figure 15 on the page after that shows some hedgerows within the scheme. Um, and it shows between block C2 and C1, a series of three 1.5 meter tall hedgerows and another one between block C1 and, sorry, it's incorrectly labeled. Oh, well, yeah, between C1 and C1. Um, if those hedgerows are there, how does that impact pedestrian movement through those areas? Because they look like solid lines of hedgerow. Uh, so the answer, so the answer to would be that there would not be a, a completely solid line across. There would be a vision allowed within those for pedestrian movement through, the, through that space. Okay, and I guess, yeah. Well, okay. Um. I think it's important to note, and I think I guess is is that this is we what we're assessing here is an outline scheme. So these are indicative measures and, and, and measures that we you know we have shown to it. As the, as the design evolves, we will, as I mentioned, we will be we we have revisiting you know the assessment at the, as, as part of the reserve matters. And, and kind of in our experience, we have we've worked on a lot of outline plan applications like this, and often there is a, there is an evolution of the design, and as, and as the as the design evolu evolves, so things like you know, details of corners like chamfer and introduction of you know, setback, you know, tweaks to the mass, and wind conditions do change, and then the, and the, there's often a need to refine the the, uh, the wind mitigation measures as part of that detailed design process. I appreciate that, but I think we we've just we keep hearing that in terms of its outline, we'll sort that at the details stage. And this is a chapter of the environmental impact assessment. As a reviewer of the impact assessment, we need to understand what mitigation is required to manage the impacts because the wind impacts are actually quite significant. Um, and whilst you say with mitigation, it reduces them, but it's really important that we understand if that mitigation is is viable, how long it will take to come forward, and if it's likely to be an acceptable acceptable mitigation measure. So that's sorry, the reason why I'm pressing on some of these matters, because if it, if it isn't acceptable or it doesn't work, it's a problem. It really is a problem for the scheme. Right. So. If, if I might so touch on the, the way that's handled, yeah. it, it is coded. Uh, I've got here um, six, Point three point four, uh, and it, it is about finding the uh, appropriate position uh, that, that um, accepts the outline nature of the scheme, but also uh, acknowledges the um, conclusions of the uh, the ES, and uh, it is uh, page one nine six. I was looking at the, the the discussion as we were. Uh, identifying plots, plot C1, which we were talking about a moment ago. Uh, sorry, page 198. And the, uh, you know, in the initial commentary on, on the, the kind of coding uh, runs through the uh, identified points. It, it illustrates them uh, you know, graphically, there is a kind of longhand commentary, but most fundamentally, uh, 6.3.4.8, the, the design of plot C1 must incorporate wind mitigation measures as identified in the wind chapter of the EIS or alternative equivalent measures to achieve the same mitigation effect developed and tested through detailed design. Uh, it, it talks about, uh, this, this came to hand because it was about the arcade and, and the um, uh, issue of can you still get planting? Uh, so can you still get access if there, there is some mitigation required? Uh, 6.3.46 says baffles within the arcades should be considered as part of the wind mitigation uh, measures. 
uh, and it gives um, a photographic example, but most fundamentally, the, uh, the, the commitment is there to uh, a, a, an equivalent in the codes, which, which we know and the future designer knows will be required to deal with the points that the planning authority have raised in the detailed design stage as per the testing of the, of the ES. Okay. We, we have early warning that there is a wind issue and it will need to be designed appropriately at the, at the detailed stage. Okay, thank you. That's a useful exchange. Um, are we going to have questions on wind? I want to go home. I've got, to, I've got a load of transport stuff to read this evening. Quickly. Can you can, yes. Yeah. Um, can I give you a personal experience, which I think will help? I have some friends who live in Marina Court on the third floor facing the De Redison. Yep. They have a balcony. They have two glass doors to get onto the balcony, and they haven't used it once in three years. The flowers that they put out there, whenever they put them out there, within a month are dead. And the wind is a very real problem in that area. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you. I was very impressed uh, with a, an on-trained person in wind uh, talking about very important issues. I couldn't agree more. And I would... Uh, I, I know Tom Lawson when, from day one. I worked with him on... And he, he obviously provided the criteria. But... He was talking about the criteria primarily about somebody getting knocked over and possibly killed. And the other thing was on a cyclist being blown over in front of a car and being killed. So it, it's not like discomfort. It's life or death to some people. Now, when you deal with that, when there's a hurricane in Jersey, um, we lose hundreds of trees. But these trees are mature trees embedded in the earth and their roots spread out 12, meet, 12 times their diameter. They're huge root network and deep roots that go deep down to the ground. We're not talk the trees we're talking about are in pots. And uh, I, I think that was pointed out and it needs to be reviewed very seriously. Because So I would push all the mitigation of trees on the site as a nicety. The fundamental thing is you need rigid structures. This scheme has not been informed by the wind. This is one of the windiest sites in the world. And it's not informed by the wind. You can see it. It's obvious. And then you're going to say, we're going to do mitigation. What do you mean by mitigation? Is wind shelves that are huge, as we saw on the, uh, on the hospital, which is a relatively sheltered site. These are vast things and walls that you can't see through. And don't say they're glass because the, the, the wind is carrying salt. So these are huge, but we shouldn't be doing any of these. You as a wind should be informing them of how to design it. Now, the second issue I want to focus as the life and safety aspect is that I will turn to the planning is that I know it's, you've done very well, but to have you, has the planning department engaged a specialist to review the wind impact assessment? No, we haven't, sir. Okay. So I think, and I think this is very important because they represent protection, their environmental health and environmental planning department to protect our health and well-being. And as I'm saying, this is a life or death issue, and therefore I would thought it would be extremely important that a, an independent body helped the planning department doing already a great job. Now I'm going to talk about the other end of the spectrum, is about usable space. Has anybody been to centre point? Unusable space. Has anybody been um, to loads of areas uh, where you don't use the space because it's too windy? But the wind you're talking about there is turbulence. This isn't wind that blows you over. This is frustrating wind. It's suddenly there and paper's flapping everywhere. It goes and it comes. Isn't that right? Sorry, to the wind expert. Uh, sorry, I forgot your name. He's on the screen. Uh, okay. It's uh, Dr. Symes. This irritation wind, and you just don't use those spaces. So you end up with dead spaces that are not used by human beings. 
Um, now, I'm just want to, I'm, I'm going to not talk about inside the development because I can see huge problems, but I'm actually going to talk about the most important thing. This is a landscape-led design. And being a landscape-led is, is, is important. People are going to use it. If they don't use it, what's the point? Um, it, could, you, could you bring up the section through the park? It's quite critical. The section that goes through the, the wall, the sea wall, and the park, because this is a very important area of wind. Um, is there a possible? I don't have no. um, the ability. We don't have sorry, it. Okay. The well, I was yesterday. <laughs> there was, I was told that you know I, the sections were on the uh, website on on the portal, and I said they weren't, and the applicant said they were, and the, and the planning department says they were. And I just couldn't understand it because I couldn't find them. Anyway, so I went home and I looked it up. And what it is, there's a list. The beginning of the list on the portal has all the revised drawings. So we've got two planning applications, December 21 and December 22. And there's a list of all the revised planning drawings. Then following that is a list of all the superseded drawings of planning application one. In that, lost in that, were the sections. Well, I, that's why I didn't see them. So for the very first time, I saw them last night, and it made me really worried, more worried than I was. And the other thing is I can't find the section through the park. Now, so I'm going to try and describe it, uh, if you bear with me. As I explained, the wind travels along. It comes, this is the prevailing winds, and it's the strongest winds the iron is ever expo is exposed to. Cross the water hits the wall, flies up in the air, and then if it hits a ridge like that, you get turbulence. It flies over and you get this dumping of wind where people are. Now I'm talking about, okay, I talk about high velocity, but these are gentle breezes. You get this dumping, the whole wind goes over and you get this constant. And the other thing about wind is it's fine going along for walk along the promenade and it's windy. You get this laminar flow. Even the site today, you get laminar flow. And you can see the sea. So when you're walking along the promenade and it's windy, it's like going sailing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's acceptable. It's comfortable to be in a breeze uh, off the offshore breeze. But what isn't acceptable if you can't see the sea? So if you're dropped down at a level below the park, this beautiful park, and you get this wind coming over, this turbulence, so your napkins go flying everywhere, everything's, you know, it's as irritating, you don't use that space. And that's one of the things that's the fundamental problems with this design. Somebody's done the wind, somebody's done the landscape, somebody's done the, the daylight, somebody's done, you know, and it's all separated. And what they're saying is, please approve each section, and after you've approved it, we'll try and join it all up and spend money, because we're going to put screens up, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And all you're doing is going to throw money away, which isn't going to the fundamental issue of the site, is to provide affordable housing. So the less money you waste, I'm sure the developer will say, we now don't need this money, we can provide more affordable housing. And I believe at 100 million pounds of improvements, let's park the uh, sea defences, because that's an island problem, not the site, to be honest. There's no point doing a little bit of sea defences and the water just goes around the corner. No, the fundamental core business is, is a lot of money, and that could be given and used that money, not to give away to people affordable housing, but help the bank that money, our money, so that we can help other people more than 15% have homes. So as far as wind's concerned, it's a problem they, this master plan has created, and it's clear from all the work that's been done, and they're going to use this expert to solve the problem with big walls, big, sh big wind gutters uh, to, to overcome the problem that should have never existed. Because I tell you now, the, the Royal Square doesn't have any mitigation. It has mature trees. So if you want a baseline, of course the site's got wind over it, it's laminated. Take, use the Royal Square as your baseline. You've got to say every bit of the site will be as good as the Royal Square. And then the public will understand what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Um, we'll uh, 
Paul Stumps there, I think, for the day. Just before we do, um, I'd just like to, to spend a minute or two with the applicant and the uh, planning authority just talking through expectations for tomorrow. We've got um, some fairly chunky issues to deal with. We've also got the plenary issue in the evening and I'm not going to run till quarter to six and then start again at six o'clock to tomorrow evening. So I would hope that um, well, we need to sort of manage um, the length of sessions so that, uh, I mean, ideally uh, I would like to finish the daytime session by about 4.30 just to have a bit of a breather before uh, the evening session. I'm not sure if that evening session is going to be particularly well attended. I, I think there are certainly the uh, the youth parliament are going to come along for the first slot and there are, I think there are a few others maybe. Right, okay. And uh, Okay, right, so um, we, we, we have that. Um, the so, sorry, on, on uh, in relation to the Jersey Youth Parliament, I'm not aware of a submission that they've made to the... It's in one of the comments on the application. application. Um, sorry. I can sorry. tell you... I'll, I'll find it. If it's there, yeah. I'll find it. Sorry. It, Yes, um, I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you in a moment. Okay, well, there's not much I could do about, about that. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so we've, we've got the transport session in the morning. Could, could I just ask, there was meant to be a statement of common ground on transport. Has that still not appeared? Uh, I believe it has appeared, sir. I, in, in, the, uh, in, my, in my inbox, there's been various documents pinging around. Uh, when I get the moment this evening, I will check that, but I believe that has appeared. It's, it's also appeared in our inbox, but we've, we haven't had a chance to review it yet. It, you know, it only came this afternoon, and that was via okay. the, uh, our, our colleague. Uh, Helen, have you seen it? No. 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 So it's no, not... we haven't provided okay. it. No, we, we've, uh, we've not, I've not read it. Uh, it. It's been produced between uh, our consultants and the uh, technical team in Highways. I think we, in this room, are in exactly the same position as that it's arrived in our inboxes. Yeah. Uh, a minute ago, metaphorically, and okay. we probably both need to review it. And, and yeah, I, I suspect it's not going to surprise me in the sense that I've I've read the evidence of the department, I've read the your consultants' evidence, and there's quite a lot of common ground there. So I I, I hope it'll just capture what I've what I've already read. Okay, um, so. If, if we're starting at 9.30, I mean, is it realistic to get transport done by the break? Um, maybe not. Um, I think one of the... chats. Sorry, Ms Nicholson, if I could just... Um, I don't know if the Parish of St Helier are attending to speak. Mm. I did follow up this morning because they were going to let me know by the 10th of May if they were who the attendee would be, so I don't know. I know the fire and ambulance service are definitely attending and the fire service wants to speak. Um, I guess those would be kind of the the areas where I'm not sure okay. how long that might take. Well, it, it feels like transport might be a couple of hours. Yeah. It might, might be two hours ish. So, um, uh, community infrastructure. There's a lot to. Com well, I, I don't think that's particularly long. Maybe, maybe hour, hour mm. and a half, um, and then. If, I mean, ideally, if we could get set session, session eight finished by lunchtime and then we do drainage and flood risk in the afternoon um, and then we could break before the, the evening session. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so uh, I've just been... Just been we, we have a statement of common ground on drainage as well from this afternoon. Uh, mm, I don't know okay. if that's arrived in your inboxes nope. yet. So... Uh, can you share it with us? Well, 
I, I, I will read it and, and share it, but I, I have just been uh, notified that that has been circulated this morning. Uh, again, uh, it's been um, put together between uh, Andy Downey for the uh, authority and uh, our technical team. So um, uh, as soon as I open that email, I'll, I'll read it and forward it. Thank you. Okay. Well, th there are clearly going to be documents that arrive tomorrow for, for me. C can somebody make sure there's some hard copies? Yes, sure. Okay, okay we'll uh, close there and uh, see most of you at 9.30 in the morning. Okay, thank you.